Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Apsley. I'm a forester and a natural resource specialist. Um, I work in mostly in Southeast Ohio in the Appalachian Hill Country. Um, we've got Ellen Crocker on and I'll introduce her in a little bit, but I wanna go through a quick little introduction of a day in the woods and, and, and give you an idea of the resources. Again, Prior to COVID, a Day in the Woods was typically an in-person live event, and these are all the partners that have helped us over the years, and we're thrilled to have all the partners, and they help in many ways. We normally program in our state forest here in southeast Ohio, and kind of the hub of our, of our uh, programming is the Vinton Furnace State Forest, and we're going to still get Ellen up here sometime to visit the, the Vinton Furnace State Forest. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Healthy Woods app and forest health issues that affect you as woodland owners. Um, I also want to make you aware of our webpage, Southeast Ohio Woods, and all the resources we've got there. Um, the big thing we've done during COVID is produce a bunch of videos. So if you're not aware of that, we have got a Tree ID series with, I think we're up to 53 videos in there now. We also have a Chainsaw Safety series that we produced last year. And we're currently working on a series of on boundaries, forest boundaries and marking. And this is an older screenshot. The new, new screen will actually have that link and we're starting to put resources in there. So say, stay tuned on that. But if you're interested in tree ID, these are three to five minute little videos. Um, you can get there pretty easily. Just uh, go.osu.edu slash tree ID will get you directly to this page. And I'll put that in the chat window here in just a little bit. Uh, for the remainder of the season, I think this might be our last virtual one. Um, we're going to try to make as many of the resources available from our live ones later, but um, with our remote programming, it's hard to do those live. And uh, so we'll probably record as much as we can, or at least provide resources later. But in, in August, we're going to do a program specifically for new woodland owners and the main goal of that is to introduce them to the concept of woodland owner woodland management and the resources that are out there to help you um, in september we're going to look at invasive plants um, and their control october we're going to do a tour of the vent and furnace and talk about woodland practices and november one of the one of the more popular topics is tree id and we're going to do a winter tree ID program, and then you can see the rest of them that are on there. So I can't believe we're already talking 2022 on this screen too. It's kind of scary. So we are also on Facebook. We launch these tree ID videos on Facebook every week on, we call it Tremendous Tuesday. And last week we featured this plant. So it might be one we talk about a little bit later, but um, that one was on Atlantis or Tree of Heaven. So again, facebook.com, Southeast Ohio Woods, if you want to get those regular updates. And then also, um, Kathy Smith in Columbus does a lot of programming through Woodland Stewards. So here's a great resource and also a great place to get, um, basically to find our extension fact sheets related to woodlands and woodland management under publications. And there's my contact. I am going to stop my screen share and we'll let Ellen do her screen share. And I don't have a big introduction prepared. Um, I probably should, but um, Ellen Crocker, we're thrilled to have her here. Um, she is a forest health specialist with the University of Kentucky in, in extension. And I'm going to just turn it over to Ellen and give us, let her give us a little more of her background and let her take over the show. We're going to kind of tag team throughout most of the day, but Ellen's definitely going to take the lead. And I also want to mention that Ellen was the driver for this Healthy Woods app um, with UK and UT, University of Tennessee. So we're excited about the app and we're um, not so excited about some of our forest health issues, but we're, we're going to deal with them as they come along. 
Thanks. And thanks for inviting me to talk today. And it's been great working with you and um, Kathy and other folks um, on this Healthy Woods app. Um, I'm excited to show it to you all today and hopefully it'll be a good tool for your toolbox. Um, but before we get started, uh, Dave and I had an idea of something that might be kind of fun to start us out with um, to help kind of me get to know you a little bit, but also to help us start thinking about um, apps and uh, Woodland Health. And so in the chat, I'm going to put a link um, to uh, menti.com, uh, and it's kind of a survey here. So hopefully you can click on that, or you can just go to the website um, itself. And uh, we're just going to ask you a few questions just to kind of get us going. So the first question I have is, what are the best smart smartphone apps for woodland owners. Um, and again, if you don't, if you're kind of watching this on your computer and you've got your phone with you, you can also go to menti.com and just use this code right here instead of kind of clicking on the link, whatever is easiest for you. And don't so, get stressed if you can't, yeah. if you don't have another screen or the ability to do it, but it's always good to with this webinar format, it is so hard to interact with folks. Yeah. So we're going to do our best to try to get your feedback and inter interact as we go. And I did notice somebody put a response in the chat. That's perfectly mm -hmm. fine. Yeah, well. you can do that as well. iNaturalist, that's one that I really like as well. Um, definitely. Oh, somebody put tree snap. I like to hear that. <laughs> tree snap is another one of our apps uh, that we created to kind of facilitate citizen science um, and particularly looking for those trees that are still alive, still healthy, despite, um, you know, all their neighbors being killed by invasives. Um, and I see iNaturalist. I see the Virginia Tech Tree ID app. That's another great awesome. one. Yeah. Ebird, that's another really good one. Yeah. Oh, the soil web. Yeah. And there are lots of great tools out there for woodland owners, um, you know, uh, in app format and otherwise. And uh, those, those smartphone apps, they come, tend to come in a few different flavors in terms of the ones that I use the most. And I think a lot of woodland owners and, and forest professionals do. And that some of them are kind of, it's like having a book in your back pocket, right? Like you've got a dichotomous key for tree ID with that Virginia Tech tree ID app. Um, you know, with you there in the field, really nice and convenient. Um, others might kind of provide more of like a tool uh, that will let you assess something or measure something. Um, iNaturalist, uh, I think it's, it's emerging as one of the most popular ones, of course, because it's got that great identification feature. If you haven't used iNaturalist before, give it a shot because you can take a picture of a plant or an insect and it'll identify it for you, um, or at least It'll, it'll try. It'll get somewhere in the right ballpark. It's not always right, is it, Dave? But, but <laughs> generally, it's kind of in the right zone. Yeah, we don't want it to get too good. That's kind of a job security thing for us. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> picture it's not perfect <laughs> well it usually gets you in the ballpark which is good yeah and i can say that that it's good for plants and insects and when it comes to mushrooms i still have plenty of job security because it's not that great <laughs> uh, so great i see some other good ones popping up wonderful any others that you really like dave merlin um, i use merlin as well for birds great merlin with bird sound id i haven't tried that yet but i'm looking forward to mm. it i just plugged in a Venza. Oh, yeah. If anybody yeah. uses a Venza, but if you're looking for an easy to use app to do any kind of GPS work on your woods to create maps and just drop pins and locations, it's, it's pretty, pretty nice. And it, it works really well in your smartphone. All right, great. So now we have another question for you. We're moving on from that now that everybody got the, the hang of mentee meter. Uh, what are your biggest woodland health issues in your woods or in areas near you? What are the biggest issues that you see? And again, you can type it in on the website on mentee or you can just put it in the chat. Either way is fine. Invasives, yeah. That's a big one. 
beech tree and leaf disease, invasive plants, invasive species, invasive pests and pathogens, invasives, right? <laughs> I think, I, think, we have a theme I, think, going I think we have some consensus here. Invasives are major issues. It yeah. does seem like things are just in hyperdrive when it comes to invasives, plant and insects and diseases in, in Ohio and surrounding states. It's yeah. Amazing. And I think it's a really good point of, you know, I think a lot of folks that I talk with are kind of like, well, um, you know, it's best not to do anything in your woods and just to leave them be and they'll be fine. And I guess my response is kind of like, maybe, but we have a lot of things that are going to come in that are going to cause problems, uh, no matter, you know, what um, those invasives, uh, you know, there's a lot that you can do to help promote the help of your woods. Um, and if you don't do anything, there's still going to be an issue. Um, so I see we've got in the chat maple dominance, definitely in some of these areas, the transition, you know, from those kind of more oak dominated stands to more maple and beech dominated stands, uh, um, which is especially scary with some of the invasives that are attacking both maple and beech, um, conifers dying. Um, are, you, so, are you seeing a lot of white pine mortality or I am. really stress mm -hmm. going on? That might be something that we don't, I don't think have on our agenda, but something to talk about a little bit if we get definitely later. and I think a lot of what I've seen we don't have a ton of white pine kind of um, uh, stands here but a lot of what I see are, are uh, stands that people planted um, that that weren't maybe thinned and are now um, uh, you know overstocked too dense and um, those trees are kind of reaching the upper end of their lifespan and lots of different insects and diseases can move in and be a problem not to mention our weird weather conditions that have been throwing them for a loop um, so I'm seeing a lot of invasives that is our biggest uh, woodland health threats and I tend to agree with you um, and that uh, those are what's driving a lot of things and that's also what I'll be talking about um, uh, a little bit more in this presentation so one more question for you what would you like to know more about the health of your woods? And this is kind of a fun one because when um, uh, Dave and I talked with the Ohio uh, Society of American Foresters meeting, we asked them, what do you wish more people knew about the health of their <laughs> woods? And we got a lot of different responses to that one as well. Um, I see that, oh, hey, nice to see you, um, uh, Phil. A needle cast has shown up in recent years on large white pine and maybe adding to and causing white pine mortality, definitely. Uh, what trees to plant, how to thin, balance, healthy regeneration. I have a visitor, my oh, granddaughter just walked in. So. Wonderful. <laughs> Sorry about the interruption. I like that. How thick should the understory be? Midi how to mitigate invasive species? Shoestring, I, I guess that might be shoestring root rot. What to do with that? Control. How diverse should forests be? Yeah, that's a good question. Chemical usage. Sustainable regeneration, what it is and how to get it, right? <laughs> Best understory native plants. And so I think this is really interesting because this question, and this is true of the professional groups that we talked with, um, the other two questions that I, I mentioned, uh, like especially with, you know, what are the major problems? Invasives, invasives are a huge thing, driving, forest health. Um, of course, there's management. Of course, there's a legacy of past land use, but invasive species are huge. But then when we get to this question of, you know, what do, what should people know about the health of the woods? There's so much. There are so many different topics and um, it can feel overwhelming, uh, I think sometimes, all the different things that um, you, know, you, you wanna know. And so that's kind of one of the things that we try to do with this Healthy Woods app that we'll talk a little bit more about later is that we try to think about, you know, what should everyone know about the health of their woods and how to kind of do a really preliminary assessment of the health of their woods, but also, 
Um, you know, there's only so much that, that any one individual can know. So who are all the different professionals and resources that you can reach out to for those next steps in your management? Um, because, you know, they can be really, really useful in, you know, what do you have? What should you do? How do you get funds to um, make some of these improvements? Um, and that was really our goal with the, the Healthy Woods um, app. Um, so with that, thanks for uh, giving that a shot with me. I um, appreciate it. Did you all enjoy uh, Minty? Was that fun? Had you done that before? I don't, I, I, I enjoy it, uh, uh, especially in this webinar setting, right. as Dave mentioned, you know, it can be hard to interact otherwise. Um, so uh, welcome everyone, uh, nice to be here. So uh, Dave and I are gonna be talking about, you know, assessing the health of your woods with the Healthy Woods app. I mean, are my woods healthy? And um, we're gonna talk about what is woodland health in general? What are some very basic characteristics of healthy and unhealthy woodlands? Um, what are some major threats to the health of your woods? And we're going to briefly skim over that because you're going to have an entire other session on invasives coming up, right, Dave? <laughs> In invasive just a plants, weeks. anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so you've got to sign up for that one too. And then we're going to walk you through the use of the Healthy Woods app. And um, if we have time, uh, we also have some fun forest health trivia for you. Um, so we'll see if we, we can get to that. Um, but the, the first kind of question that we have for you is, you know, what is woodland health? It's this term that's thrown around a lot, like everyone wants a healthy woods. Um, and it's frequently one of the, the chief goals for woodland owners. Um, but it's a lot trickier to define. You know, there's, there's no one definition of what's healthy. And what's healthy really depends on your objectives, on where you're located, on what you started with. Um, there's a lot of different factors there. So it's not as easy to define as you might think, much like human health. Uh, once you get into the nitty gritty of it, it's like, well, um, is this healthy or is this not healthy? And of course, the, the answer of it depends. Um, but what you can do, uh, what most people kind of think of as healthy, they might think of things like stands that are really growing vigorously, trees are growing vigorously, they are um, you know, healthy, have full canopies, um, they're sustainable, or in our naturally regenerating stands, they are sustaining themselves. And they're meeting management objectives. So, uh, you know, they're, they're achieving what you want for that stand. Um, but what's a little bit easier than, you know, flat out defining health or giving it some score is talking about the characteristics of healthy and unhealthy woodlands. So when I think of healthy woods and our naturally regenerating forests, I think of things like good stand structure. You've got, um, you know, little seedlings that are just coming up. You've got some nice more advanced regeneration that can fill any canopy gaps that come along. You've got big mature trees that are those dominant overstory trees. You've got all sorts of different things in there, that diversity that's present. You've got regeneration potential. So you have the potential and the ability to grow new trees um, into the future. You've got healthy canopies and trees, and you have vigorous native species. Now I put few invasives because it's really hard to find a stand where there's absolutely no invasives. I mean, you might get really lucky and, and, and have one, uh, but most folks are They've got some on their property, uh, but what's important is that they're not significantly inhibiting those, those natural processes, those, those native plants that you want to see in your woods. Um, on the flip side, what are some characteristics of unhealthy woodlands? Um, and of course, it's kind of just the opposite of what we just talked about, poor stand structure. Um, and I think diversity is part of that too, you know, and, and how diverse a stand is really depends on where you're located. Um, here where I am uh, in the eastern part of Kentucky, we have some of the most diverse forests in the whole country. And so I think that's a huge buffer for forest health issues because you've got incredible diversity, um, but that depends on where you are and what your goals are. Um, but if you don't have that diversity, whether it's in species or in, in age, um, it, 
you're kind of limiting your ability to respond to different uh, threats as they come in and different disturbances. A little regeneration potential, lots of dead trees, canopy gaps, dieback and branch tips, unhealthy trees. And it's always normal to have some tr dead trees in the woods. I mean, that's, that's a very normal thing and it's actually good. You know, wildlife use those dead trees. Um, but if you have too many, to me, it's a red flag of, huh, I wonder what's going on that's causing that. Um, and abundant invasive. So this picture, this, this uh, uh, woods that I'm in right here, you can see, I think at least like four different invasive plants in that picture. But the one that's really taken over is the winter creeper, uh, which you can see it's just carpeted the ground, it's climbing up all of the trees, um, a major issue there. So, all right, then we, then it, it's not as easy as that though, because it's, you know, how do you determine if, if woodland is healthy or not? So what do you think? Let me know in the chat. Is this woodland healthy or not based on what you can see? And, and feel free to use the chat and also the question yeah. and answer. I'll monitor question and for the question section and we, we'll address those questions and pull them in as we go. So. Uh, please interact. <laughs> no, yeah, I didn't. I'm seeing some no's in there. Well, it's not really a trick question, right? But you might have some questions like, well, is this just like the winter time and maybe these are evergreens <laughs> or something? Yeah, I see. It could be. It could be. It depends. It depends on what's going on. And I'll give you a hint. These trees are in fact dead. So it's not just that they've lost their leaves or it's the time of year. These trees are dead. Um, and someone, uh, David in the chat, guessed it right. These are dead ash trees. Um, so this is a stand that had a lot of ash after emerald ash borer. Um, these trees uh, died. And you can see that, I mean, ash was, was over 50% of the trees in the stand. So that's, that's going to be huge. Um, that's a huge loss. Not only are you losing a species and, you know, all the different insects and fungi and animals that might have depended on that, um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's a huge percentage of the trees that are there. So everything about that microclimate is going to change. Um, as Donna mentioned in the chat, invasives are going to move in. So what you'd like to see in this scenario is, you know, other native trees filling those gaps but too frequently what we see are invasive plants um, taking advantage of that opportunity instead. And it would look really different, right, if this was just a couple dead ash trees in someone's stand versus a whole sea of them. Yeah, um, and it so, varied a lot in Ohio, depending on where you were in the state. Mm -hmm. In the northern part of the state, we had have stands that were very heavily yeah. dominated by ash. In Southeast Ohio, it's a lot like Eastern Kentucky. Mm -hmm. We probably had five to 7% ash. So it's not as dramatic in most stands, but then it depends on land use history and you know what happened to that forest prior to, and, and occasionally you will have heavily mm -hmm. dominated ash stands in Southeast Ohio too. So. Yeah, and if you're in one of those areas that has really, you know, relatively low percentage of ash, and you've got great other species diversity that's there, you know, the loss of the ash is still significant, but your woods could still be healthy. They could recover from that rapidly. It's a little different when you've got something like this picture here. All right, how about this photo? What do we think? Is this one healthy or not healthy? <laughs> I'm giving you, I'm giving you some, some hard questions today, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I've seen comments. Thank you, David. Yeah, um, what happens when the ash dies? And in a lot of, it depends on where you are. It depends on, you know, where we're located. But um, replacement by maple and invasive. I mean, just like maple is replacing a lot of our um, oaks as well. So, so I'm seeing no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, I'll give you a hint for this one. Um, uh, these trees are not dead. This is a defoliation event. It's where insects, um, caterpillars, have eaten all the leaves of the trees. Gypsy moth is a good guess because that is certainly happening. Um, and I know that this was a big year for some gypsy moth outbreaks where you might see something just like this. Gypsy moth is an invasive insect um, that is spreading and it can defoliate trees year after year after year, really stressing those trees out. So if this was gypsy moth, I would be super concerned. What if I told you that this is a native insect? that does this periodically, you know, once in a blue moon, many, many years, this will happen. Um, but, but it's pretty rare 
and it's not going to happen year after year. Not cicadas, but I like that we're all thinking of cicadas this year. This is a forest tank caterpillar outbreak. What do you think, Dave? Is this woodland healthy? Doesn't look good at the moment the shot was taken, but long term, <laughs> it's probably not going to have some any major, major impact. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I wanted to include it, is that it doesn't look good in this moment. Oh, sorry. Uh, it doesn't look good right now, um, but long term, it's probably going to recover just fine. Can you all see this now? Okay. It kind of popped out for a second and then it came back. Um, yeah, so long term, I think those trees are going to recover from this. And, uh, you know, it might stress trees, but trees are amazingly resilient. Um, so even though it stresses the trees, uh, I think that unless something else were to happen or this were to happen consecutively year after year, that they're, they're probably going to be fine. But it does show you the, the kind of limited utility of a single snapshot in time. It doesn't tell you trees are long lived. Their time scales are really different from ours. So it doesn't really tell you about what's going on in that broader sense. All right, how about this? Is this a healthy situation right here? Where you've got a tree that, that tipped up? Oh, sorry, I'm gonna reshare that. What do we think? Is it, is it, if you see a single dead tree in your woods, is it a major cause for concern? The chat's so active, things rolled down, but I did see no <laughs> regeneration as a comment, which I think is very yeah. observant. Of yeah, just very limited in there. No cause for concern. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. I see this and I'm like, if I just saw one tree like this or occasional trees like this, it's pretty normal. And especially, you know, right now, uh, I'm, I'm looking at increased oak decline because we have been seeing a lot of red oaks, like let's say a black oak, which is not a long lived species to begin with, um, kind of entering the upper years of their life expectancy um, and they might decline. Uh, but if, if this was happening really widespread, it might, it might be more concerned, but just a tree here or there, trees die. It's a normal part of our forests. So, um, you know, just by itself, not a major thing. And great wildlife habitat and insect fungal food. I agree with that. Um, yeah, yeah. So not unusual, something you could see. And I'd say that, you know, these are all some different ex examples that we've given, but different health considerations uh, are important for different stands and different goals too. Um, so, so in addition, you know, it really depends on what you want. You know, are you trying to maximize your wildlife habitat and you love birding? Um, if so, you're going to be okay with a few more snags. And if you're really trying to maximize timber production, right? Um, and in addition, you know, there are these different health considerations for different uh, types of stands. So just to give you some examples of this, because I, I want to you know, emphasize there's no one right answer to the health of your wood. Um, let's talk about what are called um, saw timber stands. And, um, you know, that's a term, but what it's talking about are areas that are dominated by large trees with trunks that are going to be over a foot in diameter, um, but they're there are going to be smaller trees mixed in with there. Um, hopefully you'll have, you know, all sorts of different smaller trees. You'll have that, um, you know, early successional stuff, the, the, the uh, early, early uh, region, the small seedlings that are just coming up. You'll have your more advanced regeneration, those kind of larger saplings. You'll have all sorts of different trees in there, but the kind of dominant trees are large. And that's most of what we have. Um, you know, if you think about your woods, it's probably what you have. Um, and in those stands, what we consider health is really dependent on the state and the composition of those dominant trees, right? Like their health is gonna drive everything. Um, but of course, regeneration is also really key. Like, is it there? Um, is it what you want for the future? Or as someone mentioned in the chat, do you have all oaks in your overstory and all maple 
and beach and your understory. And, and maybe you do, and maybe you're okay with that, but um, hey, maybe you're, you're making maple syrup and you love that, <laughs> but maybe that's not what you want um, either. And so kind of thinking about that as a health uh, and how it impacts your stand in the future. And I think that's really important when you're thinking about future disturbances. Um, so that could be things like harvests, if you're planning a harvest, but it could also be something like, you know, when the emerald ash borer was getting ready to move in, like that was gonna be a major disturbance. Um, so thinking about the future. Uh, so let's contrast that with something like a pole timber sand. And just to kind of this, looking at this picture, you can see it's really different from what we just talked about. Much denser, lots of kind of mostly medium sized trees with trunks that are gonna be more in that middle range between three and 12 inches in diameter. And um, this is like a really important phase in the development of these stands because this is the phase at which Trees are competing with each other to determine which ones are going to become the dominant trees in the future. So they're all trying to outcompete the other trees for light, um, getting access to those resources so they can grow faster. And not all of these trees are gonna make it. In fact, a lot of them are not because this is way too dense. You don't see uh, you know, big dominant trees that are gonna be that dense. Um, so, this is the phase that determines kind of what trees are going to be those dominant trees. And this is also the phase in which you as a woodland owner need to be thinking about are the trees that you want winning and do they have what they need or are other trees winning? The, the trees that you don't want, they could be um, just species that you're not interested in or don't meet your management objectives, or they could be invasives that you don't want that are crowding out and shading over the kind of more valuable, um, both from an economic perspective, but also from an ecosystem perspective, um, an ecological perspective, a native trees that you want to see thriving there. This um, is also a great point in time too, when you as a woodland owner can change that future yes. and really have an impact on more than anything, the diversity in that woods, because yep. sometimes they're dominated by all the same species, but you can help some of those other species make it into the next stand or to the next level and eventually into the canopy. So I think it's a real critical time when you as a woodland owner can make have a big impact. Yeah, yeah definitely. And yes, this is so it, you know, while it might not be as much fun to maybe walk around in, would you say that's accurate, Dave? This <laughs> uh, I, I kind of like to look in a diverse yeah. being a young diverse stand because it's promised for the future for me uh, but yeah um, while we've got while we're talking we have a comment from donna about our question asking our woodland experts talking about the benefits of mother trees so i think it goes back to your previous slide but i didn't want to lose her question oh, to yeah. support young trees for regen so i didn't know what you your thoughts were on that well, I, and I think that um, Donna, the, the, the term that you're using, mother trees, um, it goes back to the idea of the mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, uh, Dr. Simard, I believe, um, uh, kind of work on the importance of, of mycorrhizal fungi um, in trees and connecting trees and um, uh, facilitating their growth and communication with each other. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, in our woodlands, they are teeming with mycorrhizal fungi. We have tons of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, we have many, many different mycorrhizal fungi that can connect to trees, that can connect trees. Um, and I think that's just a really interesting field, but it also connects to me and the idea of the importance of soil. And a lot of times when we talk about forest health, we're talking and we're talking today about like the trees and the above ground stuff and what we can see, but soil health is also key. And that's important when we talk about mycorrhizal fungi, it's important when we talk about compaction and the damage that's done in your woods and the legacy of that damage. It's important if we talk about um, earthworms and you know lots of other things too. Um, those are all things that kind of come to mind to me when I think about how are trees uh, rooted and connected um, that, that are really important for their health. How about you, Dave? Yeah, and I think the other thing to add to that is it depends. There are, there's so much diversity in our woods here in yeah. Southeast Ohio. 
that some species under the shade of other trees just don't do well at all, where other species do. So it, it really depends on the species and they're all different. They all have different strategies to compete. And, and so that's, that's one of the things that makes um, practicing forestry in, in Ohio and Eastern Kentucky so fascinating because there's so much we don't know, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good point in that compared to some other systems, we have super diverse forests. Um, and we don't just have like a handful of different species. We have like 120 different native tree species and you know many, many shrubs and, and smaller plants. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it's it's not going to be the same system to system, um, but but that's a that's a good point in terms of uh, diversity, the importance of diversity and promoting that diversity. But also, we have trees that thrive early, successional trees that are going to be the first things to move in, and they're not going to be there forever. <laughs> but they're important in that establishing phase. And then we're going to have those that are more shade tolerant that are going to uh, thrive later. Um, so, so the dynamic nature of our forests. Um, okay, so I see we've got um, another question about the invasive Asian jumping worm. I don't have a lot of expertise or experience with that. How about you, Dave? I do not. I, I can't answer that, but I can follow up with Jen. <laughs> so Perfect. We can and do some homework on it. Excellent. We'll get back to you. Um, so again, I just want to contrast both of those with something like a recently harvested stand, because I think what most people are going to see in their woods is more that saw temper stand. Um, but like that would, what is health would look really different in a recently harvested stand, right? Because you may or may not have those large trees. It depends on how a harvest is done. So if you had like a clear cut, you're going to have mostly small trees, um, you know, with, with the little, little small trees that are just coming up. But if you had a selective harvest or a high grade kind of operation, you might still have a lot of remaining large trees. Um, don't know if they're the trees you want or if they're gonna be quality trees for the future. Um, but, but different things happen during these harvest situations that would be unique health concerns. You've got equipment moving in there. You might have more soil disturbance, more opportunity for invasives to arrive. But when you have a recently harvested stand, our areas are naturally regenerating, um, ideally. So you want them to be able to regenerate. Is there regeneration that's able to kind of fill those gaps that were left? Um, is there kind of advanced regeneration that can do so uh, in the short term? Um, what does that look like? And is that something you're going to need to augment? Um, are there things that are preventing regeneration? Do you have really heavy deer brows? Is, are there kind of just a sea of invasive plants that's so dense that nothing's getting through there? You know, what's going on that's going to prevent that area from transitioning into a forest in the future? Um, and what about those larger trees that are left? Are they in good condition? Are they gonna be, you know, do you want them being the future seed stock for your stand or not? Um, so other things to think about. So when I think about some major woodland health threats in our area, uh, you know, we identified some of those already uh, with our survey, but things like invasive insects and diseases. Um, I have photos of emerald ash borer and hemoglobin adelgid here, invasive plants. And this is a photo of bush honeysuckle. Oh, I want to say in like early March in my area um, where it's green and leafing out and nothing else has leaves. And it's just this huge dense sea in the understory of woods around me, um, you know, preventing that regeneration and that diversity of plants that we want to see. Um, I'm also kind of legacy of past management. So this is a white pine stand. And we were just talking about those pine issues. Um, I don't know if you can tell in this photo, but it's really dense. Um, and there, there's very, those, those trees should have been thinned a while back. Um, they don't really have enough space and they're kind of struggling. You can see that the, the ratio of live crown to the trunk is really low. And at this point, there's really not a lot that, that we can do for that stand. Um, so thinking about the future and what's gonna go on, what's gonna replace that? And is it gonna be something that's gonna be sustainable and long lived um, into the future? And of course, a whole slew of other issues that we could talk about. Um, 
from the drought that we had to ice storms and other things that can, can impact the health of, of woods. Um, but I want to kind of just mention some of those invasive insects and diseases and, and plants briefly, since that's really driving a lot of things in our area. Just to touch on a few that you can kind of, um, if you're not already familiar with, I'm sure many of you are watching this and you're like, oh, I know. I know all about <laughs> those invasives in my area, but if this is kind of newer information for you, things to be on the lookout for. Um, Ellen, so, while you've got that slide back, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, of course. Uh, Phil Marshall out of Indiana mentioned uh, needle cast showing up in oh, Indiana, yeah. and it's we've got these problems in these dense white pine stands, but I'm seeing it a lot on just individual trees mm -hmm. with emergent crowns and stuff. So there is a kind of a needle cast decline syndrome going on uh, that I'm seeing this pretty widespread so that's something else to keep an eye on. It's, I think we just had so much moisture in the soil mm -hmm. and in the atmosphere that anything fungal and conifers is just not a, not a pretty combination. So mother nature has a way of uh, putting plants back in the place they belong. And I think sometimes we push their limits a bit. So yeah, just... and, and Phil, feel free to chime in. Nice to, nice to see you on today. Feel free to chime in and talk a little bit about it if you'd like. Um, uh, and I think that's a good point. There's always new things that can pop up, and especially if the environment is conducive. Um, and I'll talk about this briefly. We talked about these invasive issues that come in and completely you know, change things. Um, but if the environment changes, if the climate changes, then, you know, that changes the ballgame too, because pathogens are so dependent on their environment, same with insects, um, that you can get more problems where they used to not be as big of a deal. And I think with conifers and fungal diseases, that has definitely been the case. Um, and I see that a lot in our landscape trees too. Um, it is a tough time to be a landscape conifer in central Kentucky. <laughs> Uh, they, there's a lot of fungal issues. Hey, Phil, nice to see you. Yeah, I just promoted Phil to a uh, panelist, so he's welcome to pitch in. We love to have the expertise and hope things are going well in Indiana. Uh, well, it's a hectic time because I've got gypsy moth defoliation going on and a lot of phone calls. But uh, back to the white pine, the uh, needle cast disease, and there's also a canker disease on white pine. All this started out of the New England area over the last 10 to 20 years. And it just showed up in, the needle cast showed up in Southern Indiana in 18. And like you say, Dave, it's some of the larger open trees. I thought a few of those trees were going to die, but they have not uh, yet, but there's still some stress going on. It's dothostroma, uh, needle cast, primarily. I haven't seen the canker disease uh, on any of the trees, but I've seen the crowns like this in the photograph on some of the plantings here in southern Indiana, only a few. Uh, but white pine is a timber species here in southern Indiana. It, it's grown for timber, besides a nurse tree and a Christmas tree. <clears throat> And I think this stand, we looked for those issues, but we, we didn't see them. We just saw like the legacy of that, that past management. But I think it's primed for them to show up because those trees are stressed and anything could go wrong now. Like they, I, don't ha I don't have a good uh, long-term prognosis for them. <laughs> Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, the other thing you have to be careful of if you start thinning these plantations, they're pure white pine. Uh, what I know is foamies and gnosis shows my age. I'm heterobacidium. Heterobacidium and gnosum, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that is, white pine is highly susceptible to that, at least here in, in Indiana versus mm -hmm. the red pines and stuff. So it, if you thin a stand, um, it could start in through the root systems and you don't want to leave any bolts or tops or anything around in the stand because the, fun, the fungus will fruit and form on them. And we did have a question in the chat um, of someone who has, I have a forest in our backyard that consists of about 20 tree species, about one foot diameters, but there is a young stand of sassafras saplings about 15 feet tall that are very dense and are filling in some space in the understory. We are wondering when we should thin these out and what percentage should be allowed to survive. So I guess my question would be why, 
what what's the problem that these sassafras are causing there? They're in the understory. Um, you know, are they, what are you trying to achieve by doing that? Um, and there's cases where, you know, you are native species. I'm gonna be talking about invasive plants, non-native species that um, can cause big problems because they're growing so densely, they're, you know, taking over. Uh, and we wanna manage them in large part, those that are in the understory to allow for regeneration of natives. There are cases where native species can do the same thing. And you can get that with spice bush, you can get that with, um, you know, maybe sassafras, or, you know, I, I, I'm not familiar with what's going on in your woods, um, but uh, so someone might manage them because they, they have some, some regeneration, some saplings or some seedlings that are being shaded out by that, um, and they want those to grow and take off. Um, so, so I guess that would be my question is, is what, what are you trying, what, Dave or uh, Phil, do you have any comments on that? I really don't. I think it, it there's so many variables and it's kind of like, um, making a diagnosis as a doctor without seeing the site <laughs> and knowing there's so many variables, including, you know, your site and soil conditions, but also you as a, as a landowner and what your goals and objectives are. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really difficult. I wouldn't get in any big hurry at this point to, to deal with it, but it's always good to get a professional out there to look at the site and walk and talk and then, and then see if it makes sense to, to do some of that removal and thinning. And it may very well, but it just, it's just hard to know without seeing. And the other thing coming, depending on where they are, if they're in Kentucky, coming in Southern, we've got uh, laurel wilt beginning to show up. Uh, I don't have it confirmed here in Indiana, but it's likely here. And that will thin out some of the sassafras. And we don't know how extensive that will be on sassafras. The other thing, it's not common, but you can grow sassafras to soil timber size, and they would be a valuable tree. They're beautiful when they're big like mm -hmm. that. I've seen some gorgeous big sassafras killed by laurel wilt disease, and I'll show some photos of it, but it is, they're gorgeous. And they're wildlife like them as well. They have that soft mass. They have a lovely fall color. Um, they're a great tree. Uh, but, and I, I see that um, the person who commented that is concerned that those sassafras are threatening their older trees by competing with them. I, I don't, I wouldn't think that they would be if they're underneath them. Um, you know, that's not, they're not going to be kind of uh, the, the older trees are certainly going to be shading out that sassafras, but the sassafras is not going to be hurting those kind of taller, older trees that I'm familiar with. How about you, uh, Dave and Phil? What I typically see sassafras, unless it's in the canopy, is probably not going to be an issue. And usually you'll see in old field sites where it's a heavily disturbed area or where it was an old fence row where you'll get dense stands of sassafras. But generally here in this part of the world, we'll get sassafras coming up in the understory, especially with some disturbance of the canopy. And it seems to be able to survive in a little bit of shade. But once it gets a little bit more mature, it, it needs full sunlight to be super competitive. So I rarely see it as a major component in the woods. I'll see them scattered. And when I worked in Kentucky down around Fort Knox, there were some beautiful individual sassafras in the woods, but I wouldn't think it would be a major concern. Yeah, that'd be great. The other thing, sassafras is clonal a lot of times, and in the young stands, we get a lot of nectaria canker on them, which uh, doesn't necessarily kill the trees, but does make for beautiful walking sticks if you work with them. And yeah. I, would, I would just thin out from underneath in there and uh, let the sassafras be kind of a sustainer underneath, unless there's a lot of desired oak regeneration or other species underneath the sassafras, then start to take that out so you can release that. Great. So next, I kind of want to talk a little bit about some of the insects and diseases that we've mentioned already, but some of those invasives, just to get you familiar with them if you're not already. Um, and just a, a kind of note before we start on this laundry list of invasives is that invasive insects and diseases can kill healthy trees and cause big problems. And, and, and that's one of the major concerns is that a lot of these invasives, if we're talking about, let's say, emerald ash borer, hemlock willia delgid, is that um, they can kill perfectly healthy trees rapidly. Um, 
And, uh, you know, that's fundamentally changing some things about our forests. Um, now, historically, we've also had invasive epidemics that have just radically changed things. If you think of chestnut blight that completely wiped out American chestnut, I mean, you'll see some sprouting up in the woods, but it's just you know, a sprout here or there coming up from a root system. And then when it gets big enough, it's killed off again. It's still there and it's still a problem in our woods. Um, if you're in the Southern Appalachians, chestnut would have been about one out of every four trees. So that's, you know, the loss of that species is huge because it was a huge mass producing species, lots of nuts for wildlife, um, but also, you know, the timber loss, the loss of all of those trees, and I'm sure they were filled in, in large part by oaks and other species that we now have, um, which we like, but, but what does the loss of that species mean for our or woods. Um, similarly with uh, elm, Dutch elm disease is an invasive fungal disease that wiped out uh, the majority of the elms. We still have elms around. It's not as kind of um, uh, uh, huge of an event as chestnut blight in terms of just completely eradicating uh, that species. Um, there was more resistance in that elm than there was to chestnut blight naturally, uh, but still these huge historical events that are still a problem problem today and still shape things today. And I think that's going to be true with all the new invasives that we have. It's not like it's going to come through and then be done and we'll move on from there. <laughs> this is going to be something that we're dealing with into the future. Um, now, I'm going to contrast that with native insects and diseases that might look bad, they might stress trees, they might kill stressed trees, um, but they more it's, it's much rarer for them to kind of kill perfectly healthy trees or spread rapidly through stands and kill healthy trees. These are species that, again, I'm generalizing, but for the most part, they have evolved with these trees for, for many, many years. Um, so they are not just going to kill them all off all of a sudden. These trees have developed defenses to them over a long time scale um, and kind of that arms race between the insect and the disease that's, or the, the, um, disease in the tree that's occurred for a long time. Um, so you're not going to have something like, uh, you know, emerald ash borer coming in that those trees have very little defenses to because those, those insects have been around and they can look terrible. And, you know, I showed a picture of a forest tent caterpillar and, um, you know, the, how bad it can look and yeah, it can stress trees and you're probably going to, and I think Phil commented that like the mortality was higher after that event than it normally was, but it was still much lower than let's say something like gypsy moth comes in and does defoliates trees year after year. Um, you know, that's a huge, a huge stress. Um, so these are just a couple photos of some of the more, most frequent uh, issues that I see that look really bad and I will get lots of calls about. This is anthracnose. Um, this happens to be on an oak, but lots of different species can get anthracnose, and sometimes anthracnose can be a major problem for trees and can kill them, um, but a lot of times it looks terrible and the trees will recover. Um, and this is a yellow poplar weevil. Um, again, it can stress trees. Uh, this, this little insect here, this tiny little weevil uh, causing damage to those leaves um, can turn canopies brown, which certainly is less energy that those trees are taking in year to year. But it's not going to just kill whole stands in the way that emerald ash borer or hemlock woolly adelgia does. Um, any other comments on that, Dave and Phil? Any native issues that you're getting a lot of calls about, but um, you know aren't as big of a deal for those trees right now? Uh, I'm not getting anything. Well, we've had the anthracnose and frost yeah. trees in the spring. I haven't seen the uh, tulip uh, weevil for years. It's been a long time since I've well, seen really, that. We had a lot last year and the year before, but like I haven't seen any this year. So yeah, well, we uh, had tulip a... tree scale is still around. Yeah. Yeah, it, we had more, a big, sorry, Phil stepped on your toes yeah. with the, we had a big outbreak of the scale and the weevil in kind of subsequent years, and it seemed like several years in a row, either one or the other was hitting it, and we had, and we still have some pretty ugly looking tulip poplar, yellow poplar in southeast Ohio, because they were just hammered, mm -hmm. um, but the things seem to be recovering now. Well, shoot, and when we had that drought, all the yellow poplar dropped its leaves, like maybe like 
four times over the course of that summer, um, at least in, in parts of our area that were under extreme drought, uh, uh, yellow poplar, tulip poplar, when it's, when it's stressed, it will just drop its leaves <laughs> and then put on a new flush and then drop them. And of course, I'm sure that that stresses the tree, but it's also a really great adaptation that that tree has to stressful events. Um, uh, you know what, what the last year we had a lot of was that oak um, shot hole leaf miner, uh, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen as much of it this year. Um, I haven't looked and I haven't seen anything from the air when I flew over the forest area that had most of it. I didn't see anything. And that was also associated with the frost and freeze mm -hmm. last year. Um, and I tell everybody that yellow poplar tulip tree is a drought indicator. If you start seeing inner leaves turning yellow at this time of the year in July and watch it continue to do that, then you know your other trees are going under drought stress. That's a good one. And I see we got a question about emerald ash borer before, uh, about ash. But before we do that, I'm going to dive into what emerald ash borer is for anybody who doesn't know. So I'm, I'm using this as an example because if, and I talked with Dave about this earlier, in all honesty, for most of Ohio and Kentucky and Indiana, um, uh, you know, the, the emerald ash borer, the time to do something about emerald ash borer was a while back because the emerald ash borer has been here a while. And um, what you probably have are, if you had ash trees, you probably have a lot of dead ash trees and you are well familiar with the emerald ash borer. But if you're not, it's this invasive um, beetle. It's this metallic green color. It would be beautiful um, if it did not rapidly kill ash trees uh, so destructively. Um, but what's actually killing those trees is the larva of that beetle. The, um, they, the larvae, they tunnel in the vascular system of the tree under the bark of the tree, so you wouldn't necessarily see them, but they are tunneling extensively and effectively cutting off the circulation of the tree, str almost strangling the tree and killing trees that way. So um, by the time you see a beetle, you may or may not ever see a beetle, um, and you can still have lots of dead ash trees because it's, it's the tunneling underneath that's killing those trees. So you might see some dead branches, you might see a thinning crown, um, you might see these D-shaped exit holes that are the adult beetle chewing her or his way out of the tree. Um, or if that bark is flaking off, you might see that serpentine tunneling. Now, by the time you're seeing all of this, though, there's already extensive damage inside of that tree. And that's tricky because you're delayed. You know, you don't, you don't get an alert as soon as that beetle arrives. You see the symptoms in the tree that tell you that it's already really damaged. Um, and so that, that can be tricky uh, from, from a control perspective, from a management perspective, and it applies to lots of the different issues that we talk about. But more likely, what you're seeing in our states are standing dead trees, are trees that have snapped in half, are trees with all the bark flaking off as woodpeckers have tried to get to the larvae inside of them, and our stands that are, uh, you know, have, have lost a good chunk of canopy and are absolutely filled with ash seedlings and ash saplings, little, little ash regeneration that's coming up. And you might think, oh, great, that'll, I've got lots of good reach in, right? Well, the problem with that is that um, those are susceptible to the emerald ash borer as well. Um, those are the the seeds that those trees put out as they were dying, um, kind of trying to last ditch effort there. Uh, and those will grow and, and before too long, they will also be attacked by the emerald ash borer and killed by the emerald ash borer. Um, so when we think about kind of what you can be doing in your woods, um, uh, not banking on that ash region and instead uh, focusing on the regeneration of other species can be a good strategy, as well as, um, you know, other things that we could talk about, you know, how do you set yourself up for success after emerald ash borer? being wary of those hazard trees, that's a major issue, um, and, and managing those invasives that have popped up in the understory. They were already there, they were waiting, and the second those ash died and the canopy opened up, all of a sudden it's just like a, a big party for bush honeysuckle and, and, and all of the other invasives that were, were there. Um, so kind of getting ahead of that um, and, and managing it so that you get the regeneration of species that you wanna be seeing. Um, but just kind of a, a map for you all of where the emerald ash borer is right now, the answer is it's all over the place. Um, so in our region, 
Emerald ash borer is throughout. It's been there for some time, but your your area, you know, it's not as 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 clear cut as that. So you might be in an area where it's more recently arrived. You might just be seeing it now or just dealing with those issues now. And it's really important to know kind of in terms of is it a problem for you and what your response would be would be how much ash do you have? How far along is damaged by emerald ash borer? Because um, that'll kind of dictate what what the future has in store. Um, so yeah. We Any have a comment from Katarina about a few 40 foot ash trees dying and wanting to know if they should cut them down or leave them. And, and I think it comes really down to safety. If they're in a place like on, along a driveway or near a home or along a trail that you frequent, you probably want to try to find a way to get them on the ground. If they're out in the woods scattered, I wouldn't be as concerned. But I will caution folks that um, cutting dead ash trees can be very dangerous. Um, they're, especially if they've been dead at any time at all, um, you can cut it and as it starts to fall, the top could come down on you. Um, even the vibration of a chainsaw can, can cause bran big branches large enough to do major damage to you um, can come down. So if you've got them and you need to get them down, uh, make sure you either get the training or get someone that has experience to do that safely because it can be extremely dangerous. And frankly, if they've been dead too long, they're probably not gonna be much good for firewood or any other use anyway. So they do provide um, a source of, of food and shelter for woodpeck or for insects and woodpeckers and stuff. So in some cases, it makes sense to just leave them. Yeah, I think that's an important reminder is that I think I talked to a lot of folks who were like, well, I'm just gonna let it run its course and you know, what can you do? Um, and now their woods are filled with very dangerous you know, trees that are falling apart and dropping branches and snapping in half. Um, and by that point, it's, it's tricky. Um, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation because they fall apart really rapidly, ash do. Um, and there's the emerald ash borer itself doesn't hurt the wood. It's just staying in that outer outer area. Um, but the second those trees start to go downhill, it's a banquet for all sorts of fungi and insects that will move in. Um, they'll tank the value of that timber. Um, and I mean, you could still use it for firewood up until a certain point, um, but it'll be riddled with holes from ambrosia beetles and staining from that, as well as other, you know, fungal issues. Um, so, so something to note, and I include this picture just because, you know, uh, emerald ash borer is a problem in both landscape settings and in woods, but your kind of um, response to them could be very different. And while if it's a tree in your yard or a place you go all the time, um, obviously you probably want to take that down if it's dead. Um, but in woods, you know, that that's it's a different story as Dave mentioned. So just keeping that in mind. Um, and a quick follow-up, Clara asked about just cutting off the dead branches. You can do that if you got a couple and they're small enough, but in general, it's probably not very practical if you've got many. So that's really a choice that you can you can make as long as you can do it safely. And climbing climbing a dead ash would be uh, not something I would advise. <laughs> yeah, they they fall apart fast. Um, so yeah, um, so I, I do want to mention a couple other invasive issues just to have them on your radar. Of course, there is hemlock woolly adelgid, which is a, an invasive issue that's impacting hemlock trees. Here you can see a stand where those trees were killed and you've got these kind of uh, large, what would have been beautiful hemlock trees that are all killed by this insect. Um, unlike the emerald ash borer, this insect is sucking the sap from those trees. And it's just so prolific that it can drain the resources from the tree. In addition, while the insect's doing that, it can inject something into the tree that will dry out the tips and prevent new shoot growth. Um, and it takes a lot longer than the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer might kill a tree in a couple of years, whereas hemlock woolly adelgid is going to get worse and worse over a longer period of time. Um, nonetheless, just a huge issue. Native to Asia, they have hemlocks there as well, um, but their hemlocks have better defenses to this insect than ours do. And so this is kind of what most people might um, look for and see, these little cottony white 
oviducts of the insect um, where eggs are hidden in there um, and the insect is, is hidden in there as well. Now these, you, you really, they're, they're gonna be super easy to see only certain times of year, um, but that's a, that's a very clear indicator that you've got a problem if your hemlocks are covered with these cottony white balls on the underside of those um, needles. Dave? Yeah, um, if you're in the early stages and you're scouting for this, one of the tricks I would give you is it's usually not this apparent, especially the early infestation. So yeah. one of the tricks I've seen is turning the needle over or the little branch tip over and looking because they're attached right at the base of the needle. You'll have a little stalk on that needle. So we found we can find them a, quite a bit easier, especially if there's only a few smaller ones on it to do that. And the best time to look, especially in non heavily infested areas is probably getting into late fall and through spring or early spring, but then in the summer, it's pretty, it's tougher to detect. And we do have other issues that are impacting hemlocks as well. Um, elongate hemlock scale uh, would be an, another one uh, that, that is another invasive insect that is on hemlocks and can also drain the resources in kind of a similar way. Um, so unfortunately, uh, uh, hemlock has its has a lot of things that are hampering it right now, but it's a super important species. Uh, where it grows is really valuable in terms of, a lot of times you'll find it along these ephemeral streams and creeks where it's gonna be very important for water quality um, and the amphibians and other communities that depend on that. Uh, so I see a comment, is it, is it treatable if your woodlot only has a few hemlocks? Yeah, um, you, you can, and there are some different insecticide treatments treatments for uh, individual trees. Uh, in addition, there's some exciting work long term trying to introduce some predatory beetles that will hopefully eat those hemlock woolly adelgids. And again, this is long term, keep them more in check across the landscape. But for now, if you've got individual trees you want to protect, like with the emerald ash borer, um, you got to treat those trees with an insecticide. The good news is that for hemlock, those treatments actually will last uh, many years. So you can uh, treat a tree and get many good years of um, protection from it. Uh, as well as the, the fact that the hemlock woolly adelgid is, is patchier in distribution. It's not going to kind of come through in one uh, clean wave and get all of the hemlocks there. It's You're going to get pockets where it's worse and better. Um, so if you do use an insecticide to control it, it might uh, buy you some more time that way. Yeah, the only thing to add to that, I wouldn't get super proactive and get ahead of hemlock woolly adelgid much. Um, just keep an eye on your hemlock trees and when you start to find it or keep in touch with folks around you that have hemlock when it's really close to your area then you might consider treating those fewer larger hemlocks but there's really no benefit in treating ahead of time because it takes several years for hemlock woolly adelgia to do the damage so if you catch it early mm -hmm. um, that's probably a good approach and i jen uh up in the Hocking Hills area, the state's doing quite a bit of work on the state land treating, especially the large hemlock. Um, Ellen, you may not be familiar with our Hocking Hills area, but it's the most heavily visited area in Ohio, and it has by far the most hemlock in Ohio. We've got sandstone gorges, and it's just beautiful up in that part of the world. So about a quarter of our hemlock in the state's in one, mainly in one county up there. So. Cool. Yeah. And here's a map of, uh, you know, the most recent map. It's actually 2018. So I'm not sure it's still accurate of where hemlock woolly adelgid is. So, you know, keep in mind what Dave just said about watching your trees. You don't necessarily need to do it unless you see a problem, but keeping an eye on them. Um, so other invasive species to look out for. I'm going to charge through this so that we have some time for discussion. Um, there's the spotted lantern fly. Here's a photo here. So, so if you see this, right, you uh, say something. If you see something, say something. Um, but here's where it is right now. Are there any new counties to add this year so far for Ohio, Dave? You're muted. I believe there might be one more. Oh. I can't remember which county, but it's just a couple areas in eastern Ohio. 
So this is an insect that um, sucks the sap from trees, but, but the real problem is it congregates gregariously. So there's just tons and tons and tons of them and they coat trunks and, and um, will just completely cover things, uh, causing damage that way. Um, something to be on the lookout for that's rapidly spreading. Uh, so uh, kind of keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, Asian longhorn beetle is another one that we have in Ohio. Um, here's a photo of the beetle itself, this very large, called longhorn because it has these large antennae. But um, there are other longhorned insects that we have here that are not necessarily invasive. Um, but this one uh, can uh, be a big problem and it loves maples, but it also has this huge range of trees that it can attack. Um, and the big problem is it has these huge larvae, right? They're giant and they will tunnel in trees and they will, you know, imagine something that big tunneling through your tree, it's gonna cause some problems. Uh, so causing a lot of damage to trees that way. And it is a super, like a very serious uh, insect that we'd like to control. And fortunately it moves kind of slowly. Uh, so when it is detected, there is a whole effort to try to eradicate it by the USDA and other local partners. Um, so right now in Ohio, there's this, this little pocket of it in the southern part of the state um, that they've been aware of for many years and they've been working to eradicate. So most recently they were able to declare one township uh, uh, eradicated, which is, is exciting, um, but uh, there's still more there and something to be on the lookout for. Now, this is something that, yeah, it could certainly move locally if somebody were moving around contaminated wood, um, but this has been repeatedly accidentally introduced from Asia on packaging material. So you can see across the U.S. there have been lots of different locations where this has been introduced. Uh, most recently in South Carolina, they had, they had a, a new um, detection of it. Um, so this could kind of pop up at any time on material that's, that's coming over that has not been properly treated. Dave, did you want to say something about that? Um, nope. Uh, it seems to be the Tate or the Batavia, which is in Claremont County, just east of Cincinnati. That population's been there since 12 or 13, I believe. Um, and the, the, the federal government and the state has been working hard and so far so good. They've had some pretty good success, but it's been a it's been a major undertaking. Oh yeah, nobody wants to find this. And my apologies to any of you that are in areas that have this because you know, you gotta take down a lot of trees. You gotta take down any trees that are infested. You gotta uh, take down any potential hosts where you might not have found it yet. Um, and there are other options too, but th that's generally what's done. And so you lose a lot of trees, but doing that really protects our woods from this insect spreading out into them. And I think this is just a, a great great program. Um, we can't do that for emerald ash borer, right? Emerald ash borer moved way too fast. Um, we couldn't do this for, for spotted lanternfly, um, but, but if we could have, that would have been wonderful. So. Um, so then there's a gypsy moth, which we've already talked a little bit about, and I'm going to, Phil, I know you've been dealing with that there, so maybe you can fill us in a little bit in what you've been seeing this year. Um, but gypsy moth is, you know, uh, an invasive insect. There's European gypsy moth is the problem in our area, and the real issue are the caterpillars that completely defoliate trees. So they eat all of the leaves, or many of them, and, you know, trees are resilient. They can deal with that. There are native insects that do this kind of thing. They can deal with that up to a point, but for it to happen year after year with these huge numbers of caterpillars um, can really stress trees. They, they, they can feed on many different species, but they love oaks. Um, and they found that in areas that have gypsy moth, of course, they stress those oak trees and it will really change the quality of those oaks and those oak dominated forests long-term. So um, here's a map of where it is is right now. Uh, Phil or Dave, do you want to comment on the current situation there? Go ahead, Phil. Okay, yeah, in Gypsy Moth is in northern Indiana. It is not down in southern Indiana. Uh, it's If you know the Lincoln Highway, which is US 30, all the active populations are there above that anything below that we slow the spread and, and knock it down but we do have the most defoliation i've ever had 
from uh, gypsy moth this year in uh, the northern part of the state because Michigan's in a second year of an epidemic in the lower peninsula. Um, I haven't heard anything, Dave, you can update Ohio, but I know Champaign Valley in, Ohio, in New York has got an epidemic going on and I believe the first time in 30 years I'm going to kill my phone. <laughs> Great ringtone there, Phil. <laughs> I love it. But it helps me when I'm out in the field to find that, <laughs> that cracking noise. All the duck hunters <laughs> after you. Then. Yeah, uh, the Ohio, I, go, ahead, go ahead. I haven't had any real updates. Um, we've been fairly stable in Ohio since I moved here in the mid '90s. Actually, um, it the the state state and the feds have done a really nice job of just kind of holding the line and slowing the spread. So, and I think. I, that's key is the slow the spread program. So we've mentioned it a couple times, but there is this great program, slow the spread. That's a partnership with federal, state, and other partners that does what it says. It tries to slow the spread of gypsy moth. So gypsy moth has been gradually moving, um, you know, south and west for many many years, um, but it pretty slowly. In part because the females are flightless, so they aren't flying around, um, so they're only going to move as fast as they can crawl, or, or they're they're blown by the wind, or we carry them um, accidentally. So if we can um, slow their spread, uh, that can buy a lot of time. And I appreciate here in Kentucky the slow the spread program <laughs> because we don't want to see gypsy moth here. We don't, we don't want it to arrive anytime soon. And so the, the slow and spread program uses a combination of pheromone traps and insecticides to try to uh, maintain that line, allowing for gradual you know, movement of that insect, but not big jumps. Um, if somebody accidentally brings in some to Kentucky, you know, getting rid of that so it doesn't establish. And uh, there's been some, some analyses that for every dollar spent on the slow to spread program, $4 are saved in just kind of regulatory costs alone, um, not to mention the damage that's being done. So I think that's a great success story. Uh, and, you know, just, just uh, really good because the longer we wait till it gets to a new area, the more likely that different insects and diseases are going to attack this gypsy moth and control its populations better, or the scientists that are working on this will come up with better strategies to deal with it. So. Yeah, so gypsy moth, uh, always a potential, uh, always an issue, um, or has been an issue for many years. Even if you've heard about it for your whole life and it hasn't come to you yet, it could, it could. <laughs> uh, and then I want to mention beech leaf disease, because I know this is something that you all are dealing with there in Ohio, and give you, Dave, a chance to talk a little bit about it. But here you can see some of the initial symptoms, some of that banding of chlorosis. You might also get distorted leaves, um, kind of almost like bubbling up of those leaf tips, uh, death, particularly of those smaller uh, trees in the understory. And here's where it's been noted so far, uh, beginning there in Ohio, the first report. And I think this is really interesting and in that it's thought to be caused by or at least closely related with a foliar nematode. So tiny little round worms in those leaves causing problems. Dave, did you want to speak a little bit more about this? I don't have a whole lot of information. I work in the very southern part of the state, so I'm just kind of keeping an eye on it. I um, was hoping Tom Macy could join us. He's actually the person that took the picture that you've got in there, but Tom went out on fire. I do know that that area has continued to expand, and they're doing monitoring further south and west of that population to, to keep up with it. Uh, the folks up in the Cleveland Metro Parks area have done a lot of good work to help figure out what's going on but it's a it's a scary thing especially in our northeastern part of Ohio which is a more of a beech maple dominated forest than where we are in southern Ohio it's more oak dominated down here definitely and it, you know it was first detected in 2012 so it has not been around a lot or for a long time and I think there are a lot of unknowns but you can see it's made some major jumps into Connecticut um, into other areas so I I, I hope that it stays restricted up there, um, but I have a feeling that we're going to see more and more of this popping up in the future. And I'm not sure how fast it's moving. I think a lot of the movement over that period of time is awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they're suspecting it's been around a bit longer. 
And, you know, once we start figuring out what's going on and we get more eyes out there looking, we're going to find it in more places. And speaking of that, I want to mention one more uh, new invasive issue, and that is laurel wilt disease. Um, in our area, that's going to be a problem in spicebush and in sassafras. And here are some symptoms um, of what you might see maybe a little bit later in the summer, like a month from now or, uh, you know, something kind of mid to late summer, uh, early fall leaf color. And, um, you know, with sassafras, it's this beautiful red orange color with spice bush, it's, it's a nice golden yellow color. Um, and what that is, is water stress. So that those are the same symptoms you'd see if that tree was under extreme drought stress or water stress. Um, because what's actually happening with laurel wilt disease is a fungus that gets in the vascular system of the tree, you know, just under the bark, the part of the tree that that tree needs to move water around and clogs things up. Up, and then the tree's defenses to it clog things up and cut off the circulation of that tree. Um, and this is caused by a fungus that spread from tree to tree by these tiny little red bay ambrosia beetles. Both the beetle and the fungus are native to Asia um, and kind of a recent introduction to our area. But what I see in a lot of our area are just dead sassafras trees on the side of the road. Um, and as Dave mentioned, you know, it's probably been there for quite some time before anybody noticed it or said anything. And I think that what we're seeing right now are just trying to figure out where it currently is and it, finding that it's in a lot more places than we had um, thought. So here's kind of the map of where laurel wilt disease is currently known. It's been a problem in this kind of coastal area for quite a while, uh, kind of first detected in 2002. Um, but in here, it's it's a major issue for red bay laurel. And that's where it gets its name. It, it kills plants in the Loraceae, the laurel family, um, which in this, this part of the world, it's going to be red bay laurel. And importantly for us, avocado. Avocado is also um, killed by this pathogen, um, which is a big you know concern in that area we don't have a lot of avocado plantations around here uh, but we do have some nice sassafras i love sassafras and i also love spice bush um kind of both in forest settings in terms of kind of uh, as this this smaller tree or shrub that can grow really dominantly and uh you know go head to head with some of our invasives that i would rather not see as well as in that landscape setting as an alternative for some of those species um, but we first detected it in 2019, I believe, uh, in these counties in the kind of Kentucky, Tennessee border. And then last year, have found it in all sorts of other areas, all the way up here um, to kind of the border. Uh, and I'm sure it is in other other areas as well that, you know, time will tell and we'll find it. Um, because once it uh, is impacted by this disease, the wood gets some really interesting staining on it. So I imagine if I were a woodworker, I might like that wood and, and be tempted to move it around. Um, people might use it for firewood and move firewood that they don't know is contaminated with both the beetle and the fungus. Um, so just kind of another reminder of why we, we shouldn't move around um, wood, we shouldn't move firewood. You never know what's gonna be hiding in it. Uh, in this case, it could be laurel wilt, uh, which impacts sassafras, which is not a major, major component, beautiful trees, but not a major component of our woods. But next time it could be something that, that kills oak trees or who knows. So um, just a kind of reminder on that. Anything else you'll like to know on laurel wilt disease? Oh, I should show this slide. Um, this is kind of that, that uh, if you were to cut into the bark of the tree, what you would see is this dark black streaky staining. That's the fungus that's in there clogging things up as well as the tree's defensive responses to it. And in those smaller twigs, you'd see that kind of right around the edge. Um, here, you'd, you'd see it on the bigger trees if you cut into it. And um, uh, it's, it's, it kills trees, I think, pretty rapidly, probably within, could be within a few months um, to a few, couple of years. So another thing we don't want to, to be on the lookout for in our area.
Um, so with that, I want to move into just a quick overview of some invasive plants. And again, I'm going to keep it brief so that we have time for some discussion and maybe some trivia if we get to it. Um, but there's so many of them. There are so many different invasive plants we could talk about. You're going to have a whole session on it coming up here soon. Um, but when we're talking about invasive plants in general, what I'm talking about are non-native species. Uh, they're from some other part of the world, could be Asia, could be Europe. Um, uh, they are a problem, so they uh, cause, you know, ecological problems economic problems, uh, the federal definition of an invasive species is non-native and it either causes or has the potential to cause harm. Um, but in, when we're talking about invasive plants in our woods, uh, they're also a problem because they can take over. So they are forming really dense stands that are preventing the growth of the native species that we want to see, or maybe they're growing on top of and over those native species. Um, and, and many of them can be quite pretty. Uh, many of them can be very attractive. That's, that's not part of the federal definition of an invasive plant is that they're ugly. Um, some of these are things that are moved around in the ornamental industry because they look really nice. Um, these beautiful flowers here of lesser celandine and, and purple loosestrife. Uh, some were introduced and spread broadly for things like erosion control, because, hey, they grow super well in areas where other stuff doesn't want to grow. And it's like, yeah, they, they grow really well. They grow too well. <laughs> so, you know, hindsight is 2020. And now we know we probably shouldn't be like uh, planting autumn olive everywhere. Um, but but uh, now we're kind of dealing with the legacy of some of that. Um, and just a kind of a little bit of terminology non-native, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily mean bad. Uh, you know, we have a lot of non-native species that we like uh, for various reasons, whether it's that we eat them or this is a ginkgo, um, you know, they have nice landscape appeal in urban areas. Um, and there's many non-native species that are grown that aren't necessarily bad. Um, similarly, native does not necessarily mean desirable. There are lots of native species that you might not desire. Um, this is one that has just really nice fall color, um, beautiful wildlife, you know, I, I think, you know, source of berries, right, Dave and, and Phil? You love to see this one, right? No. <laughs> the poison ivy, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great and it's not a problem. It doesn't mean you like it right next to your trail or your house, um, but it's not going to cause problems in your wood in the same way. On the other hand, um, you know, this is, this is wild grape, a vita species. Now, you know, this can be problematic in some areas. Uh, it's native. It's a totally normal part of our, of our woods, but if you've got an area with a lot of uh, younger trees that are trying to establish and you've got grapevine growing over top of all of them, uh, you might want to manage that for other reasons, for your own uh, reasons. Um, but it's probably not going to take over an entire hillside like kudzu does. At least I have not seen that. Maybe Dave or Phil can, can update, update us on that. Now, there are some that'll take over locally. You know, this is river cane and sumac. Like, uh, certainly, uh, uh, people who plant these in their landscape settings find out that these will take over and grow really dense and in dense stands, but they're probably not going to take over large expanses and prevent native species from growing there. So, just some contrasts there with that terminology of native and non native. Dave or Phil, anything you want to add on that? Nope, I don't think so. Cool. So invasive plants are a problem in our woods because they get in the way of your goals, um, whether this is reducing regeneration, decreasing biodiversity, you know, you've got a dense mat of this invasive and not the great diversity of natives that you should see, they can change those ecosystems and take advantage of disturbances like the emerald ash borer or an ice storm or something else. And again, they can frequently be quite pretty like this vinca that I still see for sale um, in, in lots of places. And it does have this lovely little flower, uh, but it will take over um, and it'll just form a dense mat. Uh, so not worth it, in my opinion. Uh, they, they tend to have certain characteristics that help them be so successful and take over as fast. Things like really high reproduction, 
fast dispersal of seeds, or maybe they can move around real fast. Um, they grow really fast. They can tolerate a range of habitats. Because if they just grew in like one particular place and they were super picky, they probably wouldn't be as big of a problem. Um, and many of these, they have few natural predators or pathogens. You know, they leave them behind when they come here. They leave them in Europe or they leave them in Asia. And then they come here and they're like, oh, great. I don't have anything controlling me. And I can just, you know, grow as much as I want as fast as I want. Uh, so uh, some of them will even change their environment to their benefit, uh, you know, change the chemical properties of the soil or, um, you know, emit things that'll be toxic to other plants. And this is a good example. This is autumn olive. So high reproduction, yes, it produces tons and tons of seeds. It can get those seeds out fast. It starts reproducing seeds really early. It grows really rapidly. It can live, you know, in, in reclaimed mining sites. It can live all over the place uh, as long as it's got enough light. Um, uh, and, and other than, I think, of course, wildlife, I like eating the berries, but um, just because of that is not a good reason to plant it because it will take over and form a sea of autumn olive that nothing else is getting through. So just to kind of run through some examples, invasive plants come in all shapes and sizes, but they do different things. So you can have invasive trees that are, you know, directly competing with the native trees you want to see. Um, they are also clogging things up so that uh, you don't get the regeneration of the natives that you want to see. So things like tree of heaven princess tree or polonia, maybe a little bit further south. For you all, it might be a, a little far north for, for polonia to be as we're, big of a problem. We're getting it on our river counties and it's really expanding fast yeah. um, in Ohio along the river. Yeah, it's less less cold tolerant, but I mean, it's still a problem for us and I'm sure it will be for you all. Um, a mimosa or silk tree, uh, calorie pear, Bradford pear. Now this is one that's just exploded uh, recently. Um, and of course, thought to the, the Bradford pear is a cultivar of ornamental pear um, that has nice flowers that are kind of smelly, but people still like them. Um, and they were, they were marketed as sterile and a Bradford pear is sterile within a Bradford pear, but there are lots of other calorie pears that it is not sterile with. Um, as you can see in our old field sites and road sides, um, it comes in and will compete with these native trees that we would prefer seeing there because they're going to be more long lived. They're going to kind of uh, allow for more diversity of, of other species there, of other trees, of other plants, of insects, um, of all sorts of different things. So uh, invasive trees. There's lots of invasive shrubs as well. And just to name a few, I'll go through, you know, multiflora rose, autumn olive, bush honeysuckle, which is the bane of, of all the woodlands in the central Kentucky area, privet uh, further south, but an increasing problem in our area, burning bush. I mean, this list could go on and on. And they tend to be a problem because they'll get in understories and just uh, choke things up and prevent regeneration, as well as moving in in those old field areas to kind of prevent other species from getting started. Um, and of course, there's lots of invasive vines. Uh, the best known would be kudzu, you know, just carpeting large areas, uh, just completely taking them over and smothering everything else that was there. But invasive vines can be problems for other reasons too. So this is winter creeper that I showed that picture of earlier where it's just carpeting everything and preventing regeneration that way. Uh, it's also preventing all of the native wildflowers that I wanna be seeing and all of the mushrooms that I might wanna forage and everything else that might be in that understory to look at. Um, Japanese honeysuckle is really abundant and it will kind of carpet things and grow on top of things. Yes, Asian bittersweet, another one. This list could, could also go on and on. Porcelain berry, uh, mile a minute weed. You know, we, we, could, we could go continue on with the invasive vines list and Asian Bittersweet uh, can also, I mean, pretty much like strangle trees uh, and in, in a way that, you know, winter creeper is not necessarily going to damage those individual trees. It might overtop them. It might uh, reduce their ability to get energy because they can't photosynthesize as well. Um, but uh, uh, that bittersweet can actually damage those trees it's growing on as well. Yeah. And Asian bittersweet is exploding in eastern Ohio. Um, yeah. And it's moving west, but Eastern Ohio, it's becoming a, a real problem. And I believe it hybridizes with our native bittersweet too, which makes it even more. Oh, yeah. Problem. 
Yeah. And of course, there are lots of other, you know, grasses and herbaceous species. Uh, so your miscanthus or Chinese silvergrass and your microstegium Japanese silvergrass, this is one that, you know, has been exploding in a lot of areas too. I see it, you know, coming in on those logging roads or hiking trails and just taking off um, and forming seas of uh, microstegium, um, especially if it's in a wetter site, a kind of more bottomland site, you can get a lot of that. Is that what you're seeing as well, Dave? Yeah, we're seeing it roadsides a lot. It seems to be moving along roadsides, especially. Um, honestly, if you're thinking about a timber harvest, I would really encourage you to encourage the logger to clean the equipment because I'm pretty convinced it's moving that way as well. But it has, in the last probably 15 to 20 years, has exploded in, in, in all over Ohio, but largely in southeastern and eastern Ohio. So Great. it's an um, annual, I it's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you will hear more about all of these and what you can do to manage them if you come to the Invasive Plant Field Day, right? <laughs> In August, second In Friday. August. Second Friday. Um, okay, great. So with that, I want to kind of move on to that Healthy Woods app that we've been talking about, because we've just scared you and, and, and maybe made you angry with all of the things that are in your woods that are, it, either you, you're now like, oh, no, do I have these things? Or you're like, oh, I have these things and I've been battling them for years and I, I hate them. Um, and so, you know, we created this Healthy Woods app to hopefully try to um, especially for newer woodland owners or those who are new to thinking about the health of their woods, um, to kind of connect them to some initial information, as well as resources, because there is so much to think about that it can be hard to know where to start. Um, and so, you know, our goal was that this is a tool designed specifically for woodland owners uh, to learn about health issues in their woods, identify potential problems, and then connect them to professionals for next steps in management. Um, you know, this could be a forester, but it also could be an extension agent or maybe um, uh, NRCS for some funds or, uh, you know, different types of professionals, depending on what you're interested in. And you can find it for free for iPhones or Androids in the App Store um, and test it out and try it in your woods and see if it gives you a different perspective um, or more information. And I'll walk you through that. So how do you use the app? Uh, find a stand, an area that's representative of part of your woods. Um, and, you know, you can repeat this many times in different stands if you've got areas that seem really different. Um, you could repeat this at different time points, like you could do a starting point and then you could do some invasive plant management or some other practices and see how that changes. Um, we primarily view it as an educational tool. So not as much of a kind of like prescription, like it's not gonna tell you exactly how much of what to spray when, um, but more kind of to generate a report that you can save for your records or you can share with others uh, to kind of learn more about things as well as to record what you're seeing. And uh, we hope that'll be useful, you know, a great, great way to connect with people. So let me just walk you through how that would happen. Um, so hopefully you can see, can you see this video? Okay, Dave, great. Um, so if you open up the app, you'll see we've got lots of resources in this bottom section that you could reach out to. You can see your past assessments and you can also start a new assessment. So that's, you know, what you want to do. You want to start a new assessment um, and it's going to give you some options. What type of stand are we talking about? Are we talking about that saw timber stand that I mentioned earlier that has those large trees that are dominating things? That's what most people have. Um, so then it's going to ask you a series of questions. Did you recently experience a major weather event? The reason we ask that is that if the answer is yes, you might reach out to a professional sooner rather than later, especially if you've got a lot of standing dead trees or hazardous conditions um, that might need some, some special help. Uh, what are your primary objectives for your woodland? Are you most interested in timber? Are you most interested in wildlife? When you look up in the canopies of the tallest trees around you, what do you see? Is it open or closed? Um, and all of these questions are geared towards helping you better understand your woods, but also getting information that then you can share with a professional and they'll look at that and be like, oh, okay, I kind of see what's happening here. You know, the, that baseline information they need to start making some other decisions. 
And then we do ask throughout this for photos so that those go into your report. And when you share those, that forester has a photo of what you're talking about. You know, are, are your canopies open? Are they closed? That can be hard. We've got some educational information in there, but if you take a photo, it might be a little bit easier. And then, um, you know, that's that's just the start of the report. So if you were to continue on with that, you'd get the rest of it. Um, but if you go to the website, you can see your reports and you can you'll get a rating, red, yellow, or green, based on what you said. We'll provide some information, you know, some some responses based on what you said. Uh, as well as your responses and some feedback that's highlighted here. So you'll get immediate feedback on what you recorded, but you'll also have this report that you can immediately email. Uh, you can save as a PDF. You can email to uh, any number of contacts uh, to follow up on that. So um, I want to share with you uh, a great virtual tour that Dave did of a property uh, with the Healthy Woods app to kind of show you how you could use this. Um, but before I do, do we have any questions or anything else you'd like to share, Dave? No, I don't think so at this time. Okay. We'll uh, look at the question. There's a couple in the Q&A that we'll get to here at the end. Great, here, I'm gonna share this and let me know if for whatever reason you don't hear um, sound on it. Hopefully you do. Can you see that okay? Hello everyone, I'm Dave Apsley. I'm a forester and a natural resources specialist with Ohio State University Extension. Today I'm joining you from my woodland here in Jackson County, Ohio, and I'd like to introduce you to the Healthy Woods app. Normally I would do this on my phone, but I'm doing the video recording with my phone, so I've downloaded the app onto an iPad, and I'd just like to walk you through an assessment to show you how the process works. So I've downloaded the Healthy Woods app, and now I'm at the point where it asks me to start a new assessment. So I'm gonna click that button, and then I'm going to work myself through a series of questions. The first question is, what kind of woods am I looking at? And there's some major broad categories. The first one's an aging harvested stand, a freshly harvested stand, a sapling or pole timber stand, which means trees that are probably under about six inches or so in diameter. And then finally, a saw timber stand, which is a stand of trees or a grouping of trees that are all about the same as far as the species mix and size and soil conditions that are about 12 inches in diameter or larger. So in general, when I purchased this property, these trees weren't quite that big, but it's been 20 years ago. And most of the trees now are in that 12 inch size class or a bit larger. There are a few residual trees like the big black oak in the background that are much larger that live through a heavy grazing period. Um, I've got large black oak, large scar scarlet oak, and a large white oak over here. They lived through that intensive grazing period, so the canopy was never totally lost. And then after the grazing stopped, this younger stand came in in the early 50s. So I'm gonna classify this as a salt timber stand and get started. So the first question it asks, and I fortunately get to answer no to this, is Do you, did you recently experience a major weather event, like a hurricane, ice storm, tornado, or flooding? Fortunately, we've missed the two major ice storms that hit areas just south of us. One occurred just a few, about a month ago. The other one occurred in 2003, I, I believe it was. Um, so we missed that damage, not a lot of damage from ice. We also, I believe it was 2010, the derecho event that came through, um, did some damage to this property, but this stand was not damaged greatly. Um, some of the larger uh, trees that were left from that previous period of grazing did go down in that storm. So I'm gonna answer no to that one and move on. The next question asks about my goals and objectives. And I'm one of those persons that likes to have their cake and eat it too. So my main reason for owning a property is for recreation, a place to live, a place to raise a family. And tied to that is legacy. I'd love to pass this on to my three adult children and their heirs so they have some, some place to come and enjoy uh, time in the woods. I also like to hunt, so I'm gonna click wildlife and timber. We've also got foraging, investment, and undecided as options, but I think four options pretty well describes my reasons for owning the property. 
The next thing it asks me to do is look up at the trees in the canopy to see if the canopy is closed. Now we're in uh, later part of March, so the leaves aren't on and the canopy does appear a bit open. We're also in a part of my woods where I've done a little work. You can see some chainsaw work on this smaller tree here. I girdled this tree probably 10 years ago to make room for larger canopy. So I've got some small canopy gaps, but in general, uh, the canopy is fairly closed. So we're gonna pick on the closed option. We're gonna select it, and then we're gonna hit done. And that's for, to take a picture. So you can actually upload a photo that you've previously taken, or you can take a shot up into the canopy and it'll add this to the report that you can then share with the foresters who can help you with it. So you can add multiple pictures at that point. Do I see dieback or dead branches on larger trees? When I look up in this canopy, um, again, most of these trees are oak. We've got a lot of black oak scattered around, a little bit of white oak in the background, but their canopies look generally healthy. So I'm gonna say no. And what you want to look for is small branches. If you've got small twigs out to the tips, you're fine. If the branches are larger and there's not fine branching beyond that, that means you've had some dieback. So I'm going to hit next. Do you see many large, many dead trees in your stand? I did mention that there's a few trees that are down. I'm seeing a larger dead black oak over here that was part of that earlier generation that survived that heavy grazing period. And I've lost a handful of those over the years, but there's a big dead stem there. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to answer, my choices are many large dead trees. Um, more than, let's see, yes, many large dead trees. Yes, many dead small trees. There are a few scattered dead trees. I'm gonna say a few scattered dead trees, including this one that I've uh, girdled to kill. And then it asks for lots of other things that we're looking for things like insect damage or sab sucker damage which is a woodpecker um, if we're seeing large holes from boring insects um, so for instance if we had asian longhorn beetle which fortunately we don't have in this part of the state we're looking for cankers or unusual growths um, there are also pictures of foliage damage but obviously at this time of the year you cannot answer that so i'm going to not select any of those i'm going to hit next and now it asks for, of the tall trees in the canopy, select those that you're seeing. You've got lots of line drawings of leaves. Again, the foliage is not out right now, but I'm going to pick the ones that I see on the property. I'm going to select white oak because I know we have that. Um, we also have a bit of red maple in the canopy. Not a lot, but there are a few red maples in the canopy. So I'm going to select that. And then finally, I'm going to select the red oak group, which includes northern red oak, black oak, scarlet oak, and a few others, but those would be the main ones to look for. You hit next. Um, we've got lots of other pictures to choose from, but I've already selected my, my three, and then I can move on to the next question. Take a picture or two of the most dominant species. So I'm gonna get a shot with some of these black oaks in it, and then I'm gonna turn around and zoom into this white oak a little bit and get a shot of that. Click done, hit next. Do you have a heavy vine presence? I'm looking through this woods and I don't see a lot of vines. There is a valley that I'm looking down off to my right. There are a few grapevines down there. Shortly after I purchased this property, I made an attempt to go out and remove many of the grapevines. There weren't a lot of them, but there were some growing on some valuable trees. So I did remove many of them. Uh, but I left a few. I do see a clinging vine on this tree over to my left, which looks like from here a Virginia creeper, which is not one I'm too concerned about. Mainly looking for grape vines and possibly some of the non-native invasive vines like the uh, bittersweet, the non-native bittersweet. So I'm going to say no. Click next. Invasive tree species. Um, two main invasive tree species that we'll find in this part of Ohio are tree of heaven or Alanthus and occasionally polonia, and I'm not seeing either one of those. And then it asks, does a single species dominate the shrubby layer? And I'm looking around and I see a lot of variety. I see, uh, this is also called musclewood or blue beech, East American hornbeam. I'm seeing some small, another, actually, 
I didn't notice this, but this looks like a service berry growing right here. So that's cool, it's a small tree. Um, more of the ironwood, some small hickory. Over here, I've got some shrubby things, uh, mostly greenbrier with a little Japanese honeysuckle growing in here, not heavy. There's an ash that's not doing too well, but a small ash. So I can say, no, we don't have one single dominant species. Normally we ask that question because when you have single dominant species, they tend to be non-native invasives. So I'm gonna say no. And then it asks about ground level vegetation and it gives some examples of some non-native invasive and in some cases native species that can become very aggressive. And I do have Japanese stilt grass on this property. I've been working hard to control it, but I have not seen it in this section of the woods, so I'm not selecting any here. It says take a picture of the ground vegetation. Uh, again, there's not a lot to take a picture of here, but I'm gonna get a shot of this green briar as an example. I'm gonna say done. We're moving on to the next question. Layers in the seedling layer, or species in the seedling layer. Um, probably the one I'm seeing the most of is red maple. I don't see much in the way of ash. I did just see one. And I think that probably does it. So we're going to hit done here. And sometimes you got to scroll around on the screen to find where the next or the done button is. Is there a visible browse line? What tells me there's not a heavy deer presence in here is because we've got green briar down here. Now you can see where they browsed it because they love it. It's green, it's pretty nutritious for them. But in general, there is some vegetation below, oh, about five feet or so is where the browse line usually occurs. Here in Ohio, um, we probably average about 15 to 20 deer per square mile in southeastern Ohio where I am. And that's usually not enough to have a browse line but occasionally you'll go into urban fringe areas and you'll see a browse line where the deer densities are so high that they're really making an impact in the understory. And in that case, they're often favoring the non-native invasive shrubby species. Am I planning a harvest soon? The answer is no, these trees are just getting, you know, into that 12 to 15 inch class. The larger trees that are left have very little value or they would have been harvested by previous landowners. So I'm gonna say no, and then I can name this assessment. I'm gonna go ahead and call this oak space stand. And again, a stand of trees is a grouping of trees where you've got about the same mix, the same past land use history. And when you do an assessment like this, you don't necessarily have to do it on a plot. You wanna do it for a little bit larger area and kind of assess an area that's an acre or more in size but work your way through and kind of give those average numbers. So after I've done that, I get a thank you. You've completed the assessment and asked me to upload. I'm standing uh, a quarter mile from my house. I don't have an internet connection and I don't have a cell service with this iPad, so I'm gonna to have to hit later. And when I get back in, I will share that assessment with you. I'll do some screenshots. I'll capture a little more footage on this site and we'll share that with you. So thank you. Please take part of your day to enjoy it in the woods. And uh, this is the Tri-State Com. Great. Well, thanks, Dave, for that little tour of your woods. And um, I pulled up your report online. It said you got a green rating for your woodland. Yeah, <laughs> it looked pretty good to me. At least that part of my woodland. I'm dealing with some private issues in another part that we're going to address this year. Yeah, and even though it's it's green for now, there's always something new that could happen. But that's it's pretty cool that I could go into Healthy Woods now and like see that report and you can share it with somebody if you wanted, um, you know, some next steps. So um, I know that we're getting close to our time, but uh, Dave, what do you think? Should we should we uh, have a little trivia? I think so. I think we have time for that. And then if folks uh, have questions, we'll stay around a little longer and, and do a finish the Q&A. There are a few in the, uh, in the Q&A and the chats that we probably missed. So we'll, we'll hang on and make sure those get answered. And you know what we can do is that we could start this trivia and then we could um, 
uh, answer some of those while we're going. So yes, why don't I get can. started with that? So I don't know if any of you have used this before, but it's called Kahoot. And um, it's kind of a, an online trivia game that we can all play together, even though we're in different places. And so what you need to do to join it is to go to kahoot.it. Um, and enter this PIN number right here. Um, and then it, you will join our little game, uh, our, our Forest Health Trivia game. Now they also have a Kahoot app that you can download and it's even easier, but uh, I think visiting the website is good enough. Um, and let's see, oh, I see we have, we have someone who's joining and it'll give you a fun little name uh, when you join. <laughs> So we'll see if we can get a get a few other folks in here. And we're just going to recap some of what we talked about today, but also address any of your questions. So um, as you're doing that, I'm going to pull up that Q&A and maybe we can uh, check on one of those. Um, what happens to the ash borer after most ash trees are dead in an area? Do they move on? Do they start onto new types of trees? The good news is they're not going to start onto new types of trees. They're going to stick to ash as well as white fringe tree, which is pretty closely related. Um, uh, and, and their populations are going to get much, much lower than they were before. There's not going to be anywhere near as much uh, of that beetle as there was initially, but there will still be some emerald ash borer out there. Um, I don't think we're we're going to get to, you know, no emerald ash borer where we don't really have to worry about it anymore. It's going to continue to be a problem. Um, and especially with all of the ash regeneration that's out there, I think we're going to see another bump in that emerald ash borer beetle population um, as that gets a little bit bigger and provides a lot of food for those remaining beetles. Um, so it's going to be something, but, but, but long term, hopefully those, those beetle populations are low enough that combined with other things, combined with maybe some predators or combined with uh, increased resistance from the great breeding program the Forest Service has going there in, in Delaware, Ohio, um, to give our ash more of a fighting chance against the emerald ash borer. Um, so that's to answer, answer that one. Hey, we've Fra gathered quite a few players Oh yeah, now. let's start, let's get going, all right. Okay. And if you're still trying to join, just keep keep at it. I know it's a little confusing. Um, and can we put that in the chat for other folks, or is it too late? Can you see that? Oh, itself? we let's see. Uh, yeah, it's right down here at the bottom. Kahoot! Gotcha. It in the game pins right here. Okay, so name up. this invasive beetle killing ash trees. You should have some options at the bottom of your screen. Um, is it red? Red bay ambrosia beetle. Blue, the emerald ash borer. Yellow, Asia longhorn beetle. Or green, Japanese beetle. <laughs> Yay, you all got this one right. Yes, that is the emerald ash borer. Uh, so, so we started, you know, just, I, I bet you all know this one to get us started. Um, so you can see who's in the lead. Of course, we don't know who you are, uh, but, but maybe at the end you can, you can let us know who, who you are. Um, so question number two, which of these is the hemlock woolly adelgid? Is it the photo in red on the screen? If so, like click the red button or the triangle, or is it the photo in blue on the screen? What do we think? A long, or a hemlock Willie Adelgid. Oh, now this is a tricky one. I definitely uh, uh, tried to trip you up with this because this is hemlock woolly adelgid and this is elongate hemlock scale, um, which is another invasive issue that's impacting hemlocks. Have I, if I had asked which of these is invasive and kills hemlock trees, the answer would have been both. Um, so <laughs> something else to have, on, have your eyes peeled for. Uh, next question. How many different tree species can this invasive beetle damage? Do you recognize this one from my presentation earlier? If not, this is a Asian longhorn beetle. So how many different species can the Asian longhorn beetle damage? What do we think? One red, oh, all right, well, how many species can this, this beetle uh, actually attack? What do you think, Dave or Phil? 
a bunch. It gets Many. several genera. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like it gets hundreds. like all the maples and the ash and it go on and on the buckeyes um yeah in, yeah in ohio red maple and the soft maple seem to be where it's really the biggest problem but that area it's in has a lot of red maple and soft maple too yeah so it's it's well over 25 but it's going to prefer those maples so while its favorite is maple it can attack way more species than that and it's one of the reasons why it's such a big concern all right, moving on. Name this disease of sassafras and spicebush. Is it a uh, red Dutch elm disease, blue verticillium wilt, yellow laurel wilt disease, or green sudden oak death? Let's see, we've got our answers coming in. All right. Yes, we got a lot of right questions there. It is laurel wilt disease, although verticillium wilt, you know, it, it, it can cause similar staining in the vascular system. Although I find the laurel wilt disease staining to be extra dark in color and very streaky. Um, uh, and we didn't talk about sudden oak death, but it's another, uh, not in our area yet, not established in woodlands in our area yet, but potential invasive issue. Historical tree diseases like chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease are no longer a problem in Ohio. What do we think? True or false? Are they still around in Ohio or have they gone uh, away with those trees? True, uh, blue and false, red. We do have a related question, but we'll let folks, we'll oh, get yeah. through this quiz and we'll, we'll uh, answer that question on on reestablishment re of chestnut. So they are still there. They're still all over and they will still prevent uh, chestnut from, from the growing and they'll still attack elms. I still get questions about elm trees that have Dutch elm disease. Um, maybe they're less of a problem because there's not very many chestnut or elm, uh, but they're still around. So even though we call them historical, uh, they are still in the present. All right, next question. Name this tree disease. Now this is a tricky one. We didn't talk about it today. So this is, this is extra credit. Um, does anyone recognize this tree disease? Is it red oak wilt, blue oak shot hole leaf miner, yellow tubachia leaf blight, or green bacterial leaf scorch? See what we got. Oh, good, because it could be oak wilt, right? Oak wilt, I could have some very similar symptoms to that. This is actually bacterial leaf scorch, but either one of those would have been good. And what you're seeing on the leaf there is actually the signs of the vascular system being compromised. So it's like water stress because both oak wilt, which is a fungus, and bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, leaf scorch, which is caused by bacterium, are clogging up the vascular system of the tree, whereas oak shot hole leaf miner and tubachia leaf blight might look terrible. The leaves might look really scuzzy and brown, but they're not actually going to hurt the tree as much in that same way. All right, bold wombat. Oh, magic stork takes the lead. <laughs> <laughs> this new invasive leaf disease of beech is caused by, uh, if you recognize this, this is beech leaf disease that we talked about earlier. Is it caused by red uh, fungi, um, uh, bacteria, blue viruses, yellow or green nematodes? To the best of our knowledge, what is causing uh, beech leaf disease? Yeah, foliar nematodes. It's one of the one of the few foliar nematodes that we have to deal with in the forest setting. Um, that's a major problem. All right, next question. We're reaching the end of this. Which are not part of the federal definition of invasive species? Uh, red, and there there can be mul there are multiple answers to this question, so you can click multiple. Red, not native. Blue causes or has the potential to cause problems. Yellow is unattractive, and green is bad for pollinators. Which one of these is not, or which one of ones of these are not? Right, there are two correct answers for this, but maybe it was a lot. Um, a lot of people. People will think, oh, in, invasive, it's got to be bad in all ways. It's got to be unattractive. No, many invasives are beautiful. Uh, or it's, it's bad for all pollinators. It'll kill honeybees. Some invasive plants 
but honeybees love. Um, I, I get all the time that, you know, Japanese knotweed beekeepers love that one. Um, and I'm like, no, I know, I know just because it's good for your bees, which are also non-native, uh, does not mean it's good for all pollinators or our natural ecosystems. Um, so just, just a, a little clarification there. Red dog taking the lead. All right, name this invasive plant. Is it uh, red Japanese honeysuckle, blue bush honeysuckle, yellow burning bush, or green autumn olive? I'll give you a hint, it has a hollow stem. Oh, let's see what we've got. Bush honeysuckle is correct. It's bush honeysuckle, although it has red berries, just like autumn olive, um, it's gonna have maybe a slightly different form. Um, it's gonna have uh, opposite leaves that are Opposites opposite each the other. Key. Yep. Mm -hmm. On those twigs, uh, the, the flowers are pretty different. Um, those honeysuckle flowers were the ones that as a kid, you might've like sucked the sap out of them, like they've taken it and, and drank the nectar from them. Uh, and uh, at least in our area right now, bush honeysuckle currently has a lot of foliar damage from honeysuckle leaf blight. Um, so another, another thing to look for. And if you see honeysuckle leaf blight, let me know on iNaturalist because I have a citizen science project where I'm looking for it. I'd love to weaponize it to fight bush honeysuckle. <laughs> Autumn olive also has a silvery underside to the leaf. That's a really good diagnostic. Oh, ID definitely. Characteristic. Yeah. All right. Just a few more. True or false? This invasive plant, calorie pear, is banned for sale in Ohio. This is a trick question. I, I don't know, know if you it realize well. it. I do know it is a trick question. That's why I put it in there, Dave. Yeah, you can't tell people. <laughs> True or false? Is this plant banned for sale in Ohio? What do we think? False. It is not banned for sale. Dot, 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 yet. Yes. Right, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> yet. So do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, January 7th, 23 is when it becomes banned for sale. I think uh, when they made this list, they just didn't want to hit the industry too hard because there were a lot of nursery stocks out there and they wanted to give the nursery's time to adapt and change, but it is going to be banned for sale. Uh, can't come soon enough, in my opinion, but um, yeah, it's it's just about a year away. Yeah, I always cringe when I see it for sale places because I'm like, no, don't plant that. There are better choices. You could plant a dogwood. You could plant a service berry. You could, there are so many nicer trees with lovely spring flowers that don't smell like rotting fish. So, <laughs> and take over all your old field sites. Um, so name this invasive tree. Is it a red tree of heaven, blue princess tree, yellow mimosa, or green golden rain tree? Not one we talked about, but golden rain tree. What do we think? Red tree of heaven. Yes, this is one of the more serious uh, uh, invasive trees. And it'll, especially if you have it near a recently harvested stand, it can move in there. Those seeds can move in and take over quickly. Um, but next question, relatedly, name the invasive insect that loves tree of heaven and has recently arrived to Ohio. So here's a picture of that insect. Um, and uh, if it stayed on tree of heaven, I would be so delighted. It'd be great. But unfortunately, it likes just about everything under the sun. So is it red gypsy moth, blue golden spotted oak borer, or yellow spotted lanternfly? Oh, we all got it. That's the spotted lanternfly. Great. Real big concern for a grape industry. Yes. In Ohio, yes. especially up in the, in the northeastern part of the state. So last question, this is a multi-select, so check all that applied. This, uh, name this invasive grass commonly found on the sides of trails, bottomlands, and logging roads. Is it uh, red, Japanese stilt grass, blue, microstegium, uh, yellow, Nepalese brown top, or green, packing grass? Check all that apply. <laughs> Dave, is this another trick question? Kinda. <laughs> 
<laughs> the correct answer is all of them. These are all names for this invasive plant, um, which is, I think pretty characteristic in that a lot of these invasives will be sold or marketed, not this one. I mean, I don't think people are buying this grass, but you'll hear it going by many different names. So each one of these is a name that is used for this invasive plant. Um, so and with <laughs> packing grass or porcelain grass, I've heard both is how they think it probably got here initially because it was used, they didn't have a uh, star foam packing peanuts back in the day. So that's what they used to, to pack um, fragile items when they were shipping them. So congratulations to Red Dog, Magic Stork and Silver Bunny for your fantastic performance today. If anybody would like to announce, if, if Red, any of you would like to, like to share, we congratulate you. But hopefully that was just a, a kind of fun way to, to wrap this up and also- I think it was a great um, review. Yeah, review some things. Uh, so with that, I know that we're over, but we'll take those questions that are in the Q&A or if you have any others that come up and, and thanks for joining today. Hope you try out that Healthy Woods app. Let us know what you think. Great. Thanks, Ellen, for joining us today. And again, we will answer questions. We'll hang on for a little while. But um, be sure to download that app and give it a try. I think it's a great way to communicate with other folks. And it's just nothing else. It's an excuse to get in the woods and see what's going on. So highly recommend it. So Brian had a question about a 16 inch red oak with an eight inch growing out of the base and it's crowding it. Should he cut the eight inch one? The answer is maybe, and it depends. One thing you need to be concerned about is if you cut that, that second stem, depending, and, and one of the big variables is, is it attached to the actual tree or is it below the ground line? But red oak can transmit decay from one stem to the other. So you need to look at it. If it's a obvious connection above the ground, you probably would be better off just leaving it because if you cut it, that wound will be so large that the tree won't be able to seal it off before decay enters the main stem. Um, but if it appears that they're separate and each uh, in the ground separately, you probably could cut it. So it's one of those things. If you want to send me a, an image of that, Brian, I might be able to help you out and I'll put my email address in here. And you can send it to me and I'll be glad to look at it and see if I may or may not be able to tell you for sure. Great, thanks. Um, we had one about Phragmites in birch stands in a wooded wetland area. And I don't have much to add to that, really. I haven't dealt with Phragmites I've much. dealt with Phragmites a lot, but in a, in a wetland, uh, you know, wooded. setting without trees, not in a wooded yeah. setling, setting. So does it, is it, it doesn't barely... tolerate shade very that well. That's my guess. Um, so that's one thing. If you've got a decent canopy, it'll, it'll, it can stick around, but it's not going to thrive there. Um, uh, so I've mostly seen it be a problem, uh, of course, in like open wetlands, marsh wetlands, roadsides, um, uh, those but, more edgy types of places. But my thought is it's an invasive enough plant that if, if you can control it, it's worth looking at your options mm -hmm. and trying to control it before it moves into adjacent areas. So that would be my, my thought on it. Definitely. Yeah. And there, yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> you don't want it taking over. Um, let's see, we have a comment. We had beech leaf disease and a number of seedlings last year. We cut them down and removed them before the leaves fell. This year, all the beech look healthy. Uh, could it be this? Um, could slow the spread? Um, I would hope so. I think, you know, that that sanitation is the, the technical term for, you know, when you're removing infected tissue or diseased tissue because you're trying to stop the spread of that organism. And it's frequently recommended for different diseases. You try to get that out of there um, and prevent it from kind of uh, contaminating other things. I don't know about beech leaf disease. I, you know, I haven't worked with it before, um, but, uh, you know, with a foliar nematode, uh, to me, that would make sense because they can stay in the buds and overwinter there as well. So if you removed all the symptomatic tissue, um, hopefully, hopefully that, that helped you out. Let's okay. see. Go ahead. We've got the Phragmites one. Future of chestnut reestablishment, you want to give that one a shot? Um, sure, yeah. So there's been some really exciting work. So, you know, chestnut was 
killed off by uh, chestnut blight, an invasive fungal pathogen from Asia. Um, and since that time, there have been a number of efforts to try to restore chestnut because it's just such a central tree species. You know, I, 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 I still think about like, are, are some of the problems that we see in our woods now like legacy of lacking that in some places? Um, but some of those approaches that have been taken have been things like um, hybridizing. Uh, well, first off, just trying to see, can we find American chestnut that's out there that has resistance to chestnut blight? Like maybe it exists and we can find it. And that's been, I mean, there, there are trees that are you know still surviving, but a lot of times those trees are just you know, lucky, or they're far enough away from a source of that blight um, where they haven't gotten killed yet. And it's been not something that is really heritable and they've been able to kind of propagate just pure Americans that are just resistant. Um, uh, they've tried hybridizing them to uh, other Asian chestnut varieties to see if the resistance from those chestnuts can be bred into American chestnuts. And unfortunately, a lot of that work, um, while you can hybridize those, and there's a lot of American and Chinese chestnut hybrids, Chinese chestnut is a popular uh, kind of more of an orchard setting tree. Uh, the, the nuts are grown and eaten, um, but it doesn't have the same form as our American tree. It's, it's much smaller and lower growing. Um, and they found that the resistance is really uh, complex, more complex than they realized. And so really the more Chinese it is, the more resistant it is. And it's really hard to get an and kind of a hybrid that has all the American traits you want, but also the resistance from the Chinese tree. Um, there's been some other approaches to resistance like um, hypovirulence, uh, trying to uh, infect the virus, uh, infect the fungus with a virus that'll decrease um, what it's doing. Uh, you know, lots of different approaches to this. But I think the most promising, more recent approach is the use of a transgenic uh, chestnut. So bringing in a gene from wheat, uh, the wheat that we eat, um, inserting it into the genome of chestnut, American chestnut, so a full American chestnut with a wheat gene added in there that will then let the tree uh, fight off that fungus. So it basically de-weaponizes one of the ways that fungus uses to attack the tree. Um, and they've done this. Uh, SUNY ESF, in partnership with um, the American Chestnut Foundation, has a tree that is a full American chestnut with a gene from wheat in it that's resistant to chestnut blight. Right now, it's still in the approval stages from the USDA, EPA, um, uh, FDA, um, trying to get approval for that because they don't unlike many transgenic uh, plants, they don't want to regulate it in the same way. They want to spread it and they want it to spread in our woods, right? Because that's where chestnut belongs. Um, and so that's kind of in progress, but it's really, uh, I think, promising for those who would love to see chestnut restored because a lot of the other efforts you know, have not provided a viable option in that forest setting. Um, so, so I personally think it's really exciting because I'd love to see chestnut back in there from a forest health perspective. Um, uh, and this seems like the, the most viable way to get there. And so all of that's in progress work uh, being done by the American Chestnut Foundation and uh, State University of New York. Um, so. And let's take one more out of the Q&A session. There's one in there about fungi, and I figured you're the best one to approach that one too. Do you see that one? I, I don't. Do you mind reading it to me? says, every tree that dies in my suburban woods, elm, ash, oak, has shoestring fun oh, fungus yeah. under the bark. Trying to restore with variety, but losing faith. Anything? Oh, I hate this. I'm I sorry this is happening to you. Um, you know, uh, so in my area, I'll speak in my area. I don't know your woods, and I don't know what's going on there, um, which is, I think, important, and I'll get back to that point. Um, in my area, we have we have um, shoestring root rot, our malaria. Uh, it's, it's all over our woods. Um, it's a natural fungus. It is native to this area, um, but and it will, you will occasionally get a healthy tree that's taken out, or if you've recently planted something, um, it causes root rot um, as of trees, as well as breaking down uh, dead trees. It's a recycler as well, so it'll kind of break down that dead material, those logs that are still in your forest. And goodness knows, you can't 
you can't eradicate all the logs from your woods. That's never going to happen. Um, so it, I haven't noticed it being a real issue um, if your trees are doing well otherwise. If your trees are thriving and they're healthy, um, not a major concern because we have a lot of diversity in our trees and it's probably not going to spread tree to tree. Um, it's mostly a problem when you've got other issues that are stressing trees out that are kind of setting the stage for problems with it. Um, and Dave and Phil, please comment as well. That's what I see, which makes me wonder, okay, what's going on in your woods that all of your trees are dying? Because if they all have shoestring root rot, that just tells me they're stressed. It doesn't tell me, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's what caused it. I think that primary. might have moved in afterwards. Uh, might be just taking advantage of those conditions. Um, and, you know, someone mentioned uh, too much rain. Yeah, yeah, if you're having increased moisture, that could certainly increase some fungal issues. But I would wonder, huh, what's going on that all your trees are so stressed? And with that, I would say that is where bringing in a professional, working with a professional in your area who can come out and visit, look at things, talk about what was done in the past on your land. Uh, you know, was there a lot of damage to those trees that provided a perfect entry point for fungi? All the bases of those trees are nicked up and they're all, uh, you know, decayed. Um, you know, yeah. what happened in the past that means that you have lots of stressed trees that are susceptible to that damage now and where can you go from here how can you promote the health of those trees yeah there's probably something underlying going and who knows without seeing we're seeing a lot of folks in agricultural areas with some herbicide related issues mm -hmm. and getting a lot of those calls so yep. um i really highly recommend i'm going to put my email back in the in the chat again for you and Brian and feel free to reach out and we'll if you can send photos or even uh, take out the app and, and gather that information and share that might be another way that uh, we could help you. Definitely. So with that I think we're well past our time so I think we probably <laughs> ought to wrap it up. I really appreciate everybody hanging on. Um, we had I think 73 or 74 attendees and most hung on till the pretty much the bitter end. So really appreciate everyone's patience and really appreciate you, Ellen, for spending the, the morning, late morning with us. Oh, my Ohio. pleasure. Thanks and, for, thanks for having me. And it's yeah. and great to talk with all of you about, you know, the health of your woods and the things that are impacting it and also what you can be doing to, to benefit your trees. And I also want to thank Phil for joining us. Yeah. Um, pleasant surprise to have a, an expert from one of our neighboring states come on and provide a little bit of additional information. So thanks again, Phil, for joining us as well. And Definitely. Julie, Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. Glad to do it. All right. Well, everybody have a great day and try to get out there and enjoy it. It's a little, it's getting a little nicer for at least a day or two here. Yeah. I've got to go spray some winter creeper right now. So uh, <laughs> I hope you also manage your invasives today or this weekend. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks enjoy. everybody.